Um, so good morning, everyone, and welcome. I'm Corey Bartman from um, the Rockefeller University. Uh, Rafa Yusuf from Columbia University. And so this meeting has been started um, really by the, the US government, which asked the National Science Foundation to convene all of the groups working on global brain projects around the world and start to think about cooperation and the ways that these different groups could interact with each other. We've been incredibly happy with the number of people who've come. We've been incredibly happy with the number of people who've identified themselves in countries we didn't even know were having new brain projects. Um, and we'd like to really recognize that as much as we can during the course of the day. Um, we are going to start the meeting with the three of the people who've been really instrumental in this meeting and in brain research in the United States. Um, France Cordoba from the NSF, Robert Kahn from the Kabli Foundation, and Tom Khalil from the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. Um, just to add to what Corey has said, uh, uh, so we're here really representing the American people through its Congress, and uh, Corey and I uh, were asked to, uh, to uh, organize this meeting because we organize uh, the teams of people that we each represent uh, uh, that uh, started or inspire and got started the uh, what's known as the brain initiative in the US um, and uh, the rationale for the meeting is very simple just three parts in the morning we're going to hear what different uh, uh, international uh, initiatives are doing and also what private partners either foundations or companies uh, have launched uh, then we have a section of the meeting in which we're going to uh, briefly uh, review the progress in the cutting edge uh, areas of neuroscience and Corey and I decided uh, that we would give the opportunity to do that review to the younger generation because those are the people that are going to be uh, for which these initiatives are meant. So it's going to be, you're going to be hearing uh, assistant professors, people who just started their own labs, uh, so that they're going to speak freely about their minds, uh, what is the, what should be done and what do they identify as the, as the, as the frontier of the field. And then the final wrap-up sessions of the meeting, the last third, is just going to be uh, going back to the purpose of the meeting, which is to build bridges across all these initiatives uh, in a spirit of synergy and cooperation so that we can do something together that we cannot do independently. And uh, also just to uh, highlight that we've asked uh, to inspire us, uh, David Schumacher, who's uh, the head of the legal project at MIT, um, as an example of, uh, of science that can be uh, very fruitful if, if done cooperatively, and he's going to give a keynote in the morning. Thank you. So the first uh, speaker, uh, Francis Cordova, is going to start a meeting from the NSF. Good morning. Welcome, everyone, to the Coordinating Global Brain Projects Conference. Thank you to Corey Bargman and our host, the Rockefeller University, one of the leading biomedical research centers in the world, and whose researchers have made numerous influential contributions to biology and medicine. And thank you to Rafa Yusta, Columbia University, and Columbia's Neurotechnology Center as well whose world-renowned science departments have been home to many of the world's greatest discoveries. And thank you to the Kavli Foundation for its dedication to advancing science for the benefit of humanity, supporting scientists in their work, and promoting these breakthroughs to an appreciative public. And I also want to thank the White House for its um, verve and uh, its energy in getting uh, the brain initiative with a particular slant, that of neurotechnologies, really going and empowering all of us in the federal government to, uh, to jump on board and join the best brains in the world to ma really make this happen, make a difference. Our understanding of the human brain is quite limited due to its complexity. However, because of new revolutionary technologies developed in recent years, neuroscientists across the globe believe they're on the verge of significant advancements in fundamental knowledge about the brain and about behavior. Now is the perfect time to come together and capitalize on this moment. Countries around the world have felt the significance of the moment, embarking on their own large-scale efforts in neuroscience such as the Japanese Brain Minds Project. 
the EU Human Brain Project, the Korean Brain Project, and other such efforts. We'll be hearing more about that today. I believe that all of these brilliant minds across the globe can coordinate their work, culminating in ultimate success. I also believe that NSF, as a primary funder in the US of fundamental research, has a major role to play in this moment of opportunity for global collaboration. Here in the US, cracking the code of the human brain is a national imperative. So much so that this gathering is actually a congressional mandate as part of our national brain initiative, the President's Brain Initiative. However, I believe that we would all be here without such a directive because we all know how important this calling is. So we come together today armed with the knowledge that our respective brain research projects have given us. And this moment compels us all to take the next step. This moment calls for the creation of an international brain initiative where all of our global brilliance can fire together to share data and tools. We envision leveraging the wealth of knowledge and resources from private foundation projects. We see a worldwide coordination of funding mechanisms to promote high impact collaborations. This will eventually lead to the establishment of what some are calling an international brain repository or brain station, where data from the various international brain projects can be stored, analyzed, integrated, and modeled together in order to maximize our understanding of brain functions, harnessing the power of big data and other tools. We know that worldwide scientific teamwork can succeed because it's triumph in many disciplines. And we'll see an example of that this morning. The LIGO scientific collaboration is a paragon of how several countries can work together closely to jointly analyze data in pursuit of scientific breakthroughs. NSF has firsthand knowledge of that this type of global collaboration on high risk, high reward projects can result in an amazing discovery. The discovery of gravitational waves by the LIGO project and the discovery of the Higgs boson by the Large Hadron uh, Collider, both of which had vigorous NSF participation, as well as, of course, worldwide collaboration, shows uh, our instances of what's possible when the best and brightest around the world coordinate for a singular cause, unbound by disciplinary unbound by national limits. J.D. Rockefeller once stated that a rule for success was to, quote, strike out on new paths. Today is our opportunity to chart a new path towards understanding the complexity of the brain. What we learn from this endeavor is sure to enhance society in ways that we can only barely begin to imagine. So thank you, welcome to today's conference at Rockefeller University. Thank you. So our next speaker is uh, Robert Kahn from the Cavity Foundation. Bob, you want to say some few words? Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, this is going to be, I hope, a transformative day when we look back five or 10 years from now at the development of neuroscience around the globe. Uh, I want to thank uh, Franz Cordova and Jim Olds and the people at NSF for asking us to partner with them in helping bring this meeting together. Uh, just a couple of other thank yous and a few words uh, to Corey Bardman and, and Rafa Uste, both of whom lead Kavli Institutes in neuroscience at their respective universities. Uh, you, you put in an enormous amount of work to get this together, and you deserve a round of applause right at the beginning. I want to say thank you to the next speaker, uh, Tom Khalil, and I'll tell you why when I tell a little story. Uh, and finally, I want to thank Myung Chun and the science team at the Kavli Foundation. 
Uh, I did essentially nothing. They did essentially everything. And uh, it was enormously good partnering between us and the various uh, organizations that brought this together. So the few moments I have, what I'd like to focus on is the partnership between philanthropy, private foundations, and the government, public-private partnering. Uh, it is possible. It can be rewarding. It can be transformative. Uh, and the best way to illustrate that is perhaps with a story. I could tell you several stories from the area that Franz Cordova is uh, expert in, in astrophysics and astronomy, where telescopes are built by often by private support and then supported in their operation by the government. But I, this is a neuroscience meeting, so let me talk about how did the origins of the Brain Initiative come about? And it really is an exemplar, a real story of how public-private partnering can make an extraordinary difference. So let me f go back five years to the day, five years, September 2011. Um, three foundations, the Cavalry Foundation, the Gatsby Foundation of Lord Sainsbury in the UK, and the Allen Institute in, up in the state of Washington, co-organized the meeting at the Cavalry Royal Society International Center just outside London. And the question was, what are the opportunities at the intersection of nanoscience and neuroscience? And we invited about 35 or 40 people, mostly from those two fields, but some interlopers, one of whom I said hello to this morning, George Church, a geneticist from Harvard. And uh, they spent two days, uh, on the one hand, teaching one another about what goes on in each of these fields, arguing sometimes vehemently with one another. But towards the end, they asked the question, what is the low-hanging fruit opportunities that we could move forward with? And what are some of the blue sky ideas? And when they got to the blue sky ideas, the notion that we might, over the next 10 or 20 years, map the functioning brain, not the static brain, might be a real possibility, particularly with all of the advances in tool development coming out of the nanoscience field. Well, five scientists who attended the meeting came together, two in nano, two in neuro, and George Church, uh, Rafa among them, and they uh, developed a white paper. Uh, Myung Chun joined them, and uh, the six of them really pushed this forward. First meeting was where Tom Khalil comes into the story. We turned to OSTP, the Office of Science and Technology Policy at the White House, and asked, could you help this group of scientists come and expose this idea to the various agency heads and people? That was in December of 2011. They, he organized it. He helped keep, bring all the people together. The, the scientists went back, had a great conversation. I think they went back once more in February. They had at least two of those meetings. The scientists themselves then started a, a movement, and neuroscientists began to join it, and nanoscientists began to join it. And fast forward a year later, there was the view, not universally held, but there was a view that this could really make a difference. This might really be possible. And sure enough, in April of 2013, we found ourselves in the East Room of the White House with President Obama announcing the U.S. Brain Initiative. Now, that's 18 months from the idea that we might be able to think about a coordinated effort to map the functioning brain to the President of the United States announcing this major, imaginative, bold initiative. It started uh, with a meeting among scientists. It was really ground up. It had the engagement of private philanthropy. It then had the enormous engagement, and I will stop. We had the enormous engagement of the government, and the outcome is here we are today. There was an enormous effort also in Europe. We're now looking to coordinate all of this. So I think today is our opportunity to really build upon public-private partnerships. And those of you who are from abroad, where private philanthropy is less common than in the United States, I would simply urge you to find those foundations in Europe and Asia and elsewhere and ask them to become involved with you in a very productive and creative way. Thank you, and I know today will be a phenomenal day for all of us. So the next speaker is uh, Thomas Khalil, Deputy Director of Science 
and Innovation to the Office of Science and Technology of the White House, and without whom we wouldn't be here. Tom, welcome. Good morning. Is everyone fired up and ready to go? Okay. So uh, you've heard a, a number of the speakers say that uh, you know this event will determine uh, whether or not there is a groundswell for uh, international collaboration. So no pressure, uh, but uh, we're expecting uh, great things from you. Uh, I I want to join the the uh, previous speakers uh, in thanking everyone who made today uh, possible. All the agencies, uh, the National Science Foundation, the National Institutes of Health, um, the. Uh, uh, DARPA, uh, IARPA, the Department of Energy, uh, the Food and Drug Administration, who are all supporting uh, the, uh, the U.S. Brain Initiative, and uh, the uh, Kavli Foundation that, that played a critical role in uh, getting this effort off the ground, and all of the uh, scientists and engineers who worked uh, tirelessly uh, to come up with the ideas that really inspired the Brain Initiative. Um, and I, I just wanted to say a little bit about uh, what, what was it that motivated uh, President Obama to embrace this idea. Uh, so w one was the notion of uh, expanding the frontiers of human knowledge about how the brain works. So uh, clearly one very important motivation was that there's a huge amount that we don't know about how uh, 80 billion neurons and 100 trillion synapses interact to create learning, memory, perception, action, consciousness, all the other uh, truly amazing things that the human brain is capable of. Uh, the second is the hope that uh, down the road, certainly not immediately, but down the road, this would also improve our ability to diagnose, treat, prevent uh, diseases of the brain. Uh, so if you look at the United States alone, uh, a single disease, Alzheimer's, is projected to cost the United States a trillion dollars. Uh, and in addition to the staggering economic costs, the, the human costs, both for the people who are afflicted with the disease um, and, uh, and their family members and, and caregivers. Uh, so, uh, so if you think research is expensive, uh, the cost of inaction are uh, immeasurably higher. Uh, and the third motivation was that there may be some things that, that come out of this that are also technologically relevant. Um, so their uh, governments around the world are, are working uh, with the private sector and academia uh, on the development of uh, computers that are capable of a billion billion calculations per second, which is one with 18 zeros after it. Uh, and one of the challenges is, is if we just built those machines using a business as usual approach, uh, each of those supercomputers would require their own dedicated power plant. Uh, which is obviously not something that is good from a sustainability uh, or an affordability perspective. Uh, and yet the human brain only uses 20 watts of energy. Uh, so, so clearly, uh, Mother Nature has s figured out something very important about low power computing. Um, the great results that we've been getting uh, in, in areas like uh, convolutional neural networks uh, and, and deep learning and, and artificial intelligence we do through supervised approaches to machine learning, which involve uh, uh, showing a, an algorithm, um, you know, thousands or, or even uh, millions of examples of the things that we want uh, these uh, uh, artificial neural networks to be able to, to discriminate. Um, and yet somehow uh, the human brain is capable of learning from uh, one-shot learning. So, you, you know, a small child does not have to burn their, their hand on a stove a thousand times. Uh, before that they, they learn that that is a bad idea. Um, so I think that uh, computer scientists and engineers have a lot to learn about uh, how, the, how the human brain works. So those are uh, some of the motivations. I, I think a, a broader motivation uh, was uh, the importance of identifying uh, ambitious goals that have the potential to uh, capture the public imagination. Um, I think one of the things that uh, g governments all over the world are, are struggling with this, is how do we uh, uh, not only sustain, but hopefully increase our investment in, in research and development. I think one of the ways to do that uh, is to give people a sense for what might be possible uh, if governments 
uh, uh, sustain and even increase their commitment to investing in, in long-term uh, science and technology. Uh, and being able to, to say that uh, you know, we'd be able to increase the uh, success rate of proposals from 12% to 14%, while that might be deeply meaningful to the research community, uh, is not perhaps uh, the best way to uh, inspire the public. So giving people a sense for what might be possible, uh, I think, is, is very important. So I'm really looking forward to the results from this, uh, from this workshop, and I hope you will uh, uh, chart a course uh, for the future of international collaboration in this area. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. So um, now we're uh, going to hear uh, David Schumacher, who uh, represents the LIGO project, uh, director of the LIGO uh, lab at MIT. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me here to speak. Um, although I must say, at first when I received the invitation, I was baffled why it was relevant to what you're trying to accomplish here. Um, but um, after reading a little bit about it and talking a little bit with, a, with, a, with Rafa, among others, I understood that we have faced some challenges that you are now facing in terms of, of getting a, a synergistic motion of a large number of people to work in a common way toward a problem. So I want to give you a bit of a story in parallel, our scientific adventure as well as our collaborative sociological adventure. Um, so I'll walk you through this bit of history, bit of science. And I'm going to move fairly quickly. I have a lot to say and also want to help keep the uh, schedule um, in line. A lot of what we do is possible because of Einstein's brilliance, his insights. And specifically, um, he developed first the theory of special relativity in 1905 to help us understand how electricity and magnetism work when we have sources that are moving. We then moved on to general relativity just 10 years later where he was able to understand how gravitation um, can influence matter. And that's really where the, it gets close to our um, goals, which were to understand gravitational waves. And it fell nat very naturally out of his theory of uh, general relativity. To give you a sense of what it's about, there's a strain in space, like a stretching of a rubber band, a delta L over L. And it's proportional to 1 over R. The amplitude falls off as 1 over R. There's this terrible factor of c to the fourth in the denominator in any set of units. That's a very bad thing to see before the signal you're trying to detect. And then there is the, um, the non-spherical part of the change in angular momentum of the system. And a classic system for us is two um, objects. Let's call them, say, neutron stars. Let's imagine they're rotating around each other at a you know, separation of 2r. Um, and they're somewhere off in the Virgo cluster. You can calculate what the stretching of the rubber band of space is for that, and you end up with this terrible number. That is to say, if that happens in the Virgo cluster, two stars orbiting around each other, a meter stick, which um, is in the path of those gravitational waves, will change its length by 10 to the minus 21 meters. So that's the measurement challenge that we had to be able to detect um, gravitational waves. Um, and this is a vision of, a uh, very simplified vision of how Albert Einstein changed the way we thought about gravitation. Um, Newton had us thinking of an attractive force like magnetism between two objects, whereas um, Einstein thought of this as a distortion of space-time. Here's three-dimensional space slammed down to two dimensions to make it easy to look at. And the Earth here, which has its own little dimple, just runs around an equal potential of this distortion in space-time. So this is a fairly mild example of the sun. And in fact, there were these beautiful observations made of starlight being bent around the sun that made the first clear indication that Einstein was on the right track. This is an Ill, a simulation of the um, event that LIGO first saw of two black holes orbiting around each other. Once again, we're in a map of space-time, and now we have these infinitely deep troughs underneath the two black holes which are orbiting around each other. Um, you can see at the bottom here a trace which shows the change in the length of our meter stick at the Earth. Um, it's a, a quasi-sinusoidal waveform, something that is accelerating in frequency and in amplitude as the two objects, the two black holes, get closer and closer, losing energy because of the gravitational waves that they're giving off. The distortion of space-time becomes more and more extreme as the two objects approach each other. And in fact, we'll slow down the film right here to show just how um, disrupted distance is between these two objects. You might say they're going around at half the speed of light at a 500 kilometer distance between the two of them, but you can't really call it 500 kilometers. At the moment of coalescence, you have the maximum of signal. Then the black hole wobbles gently a little bit, and 
everything is quiet from then onward. The only way to see this object is through observing gravitational waves because there are no photons involved here. Those gravitational waves propagate out at the speed of light, or the speed of gravitational waves, if you prefer, and um, onto, the, onto the, uh, the Earth 1.3 billion years later, this being 1.3 billion light years away. So here we can turn the page and start to talk about people um, because it starts to relate to the challenges of community. Ray Weiss, a, a young professor at MIT at that time, was uh, teaching general relativity, keeping just a couple of pages ahead of his students, and he said, I want to give them a tough problem. Imagine using this newfangled thing called a laser and uh, using it in an interferometer as a way of detecting gravitational waves. So the students got the problem right, but Ray fell headlong into it. And he wrote up in, in uh, 1972 an internal report, which has been really our, our guidebook ever since th that time. What was his idea? This is another simulation. Imagine there's a gravitational wave that's propagating along, and you have circles of, of free masses. As the gravitational wave passes, it first squeezes in one dimension and then in the other dimension the distances between. And Ray's inspiration was to try and measure the dif difference in distance between this axis and this axis. And the tool that he wanted to use was a Michelson interferometer. Now I imagine this gravitational wave falling onto the plane of an optical table. And I have a little simulation here to show you. We have a laser. It shines a light onto a 50-50 beam splitter. That light goes out to two remote mirrors. It's reflected back, and the two beams are recombined at the beam splitter. Thinking in the wave um, vision of um, light, you can imagine that either those troughs line up or they are in anti-alignment. Um, and by changing the arm lengths, just as a gravitational wave does, um, we can change the um, intensity of the light at the output of this interferometer. It's a transducer from, going from a space-time strain to a photo current in a photodiode that's connected to this thing here. So it's a beautiful device. It's conceptually very, very simple, um, and it can be brought to the requisite sensitivity with enough elaboration. Um, I do want to point out an important point, and that is that gravitational waves that we detect are very long compared with our instruments, and so just like radio waves, the longer you make the instrument, the larger the signal. Make it 10 times longer, you have a 10 times larger signal. So we took the packet of ideas that Ray had in mind and started to hack away at the various different technical, individual technical problems that were involved in actually getting to a solution that could have the requisite sensitivity. Here you see the dingy laboratory where I spent my graduate school days at MIT, and you can sort of make out um, there's a beam splitter here, there's a laser here, an old argon ion gas laser, a couple of right angle arms and then mirrors at the end, and this is just to test out various different aspects of the scheme that were required to make this detection. So here we are in the early 80s. There had been these acoustic bar antennas. Joe Weber was really the pioneer of our field and of that approach, but which didn't really pay off. The interferometric technique started to garner, in garner interest in the mid-70s, um, thanks uh, principally to Ray's efforts. But we had these widely separated groups of five to 10 persons, Munich, Glasgow, MIT, Caltech, people working away at these problems. Precision measurement community more broadly, especially timekeeping, JILA, and so forth and so on, were working on related challenges. And the theory and data analysis techniques advanced in fits and starts. Um, there were some efforts to join numerical relativity into challenges, a bit the same kind of, of, of bringing together independent researchers to a, co a coherent direction. That worked kind of, um, but the efforts were mostly independent. There was also some sense of competition and caution in sharing between groups. It seemed like the, uh, the, the precious um, ex exchange value was in keeping your ideas to yourself. But there were a growing collection of solutions to the key technical problems, the predictions of waveforms, and techniques to extract the data. Most of the scientists outside of the field in this epoch, and many even in the field at this time, uh, would have subscribed to Eddington's uh, very, very nicely put, gravitational waves travel at the speed of thought. Um, they'll, they'll never be detected. They're, they're a, an, a purely academic interest. So now we move to the late 80s after things like the prototype I worked on and various other sorts of efforts had taken place. And Ray Weiss and Kip Thorne, uh, um, they started a field that the instrumentation and the understanding of the astrophysics were within reach. But the NSF clearly couldn't support uncoordinated, much less competing efforts. Uh, otherwise said, not all the flowers could be allowed, uh, cultivated to the point of blooming. We just didn't have the resources to do that, either the human resources or the financial resources. So LIGO was proposed as a Caltech-MIT joint effort to build two observatories and use them to search for gravitational waves. Um, 
I would have to say, though, at that point, the joint effort was still rocky. It was understood by these leaders that this was a necessary step, but by the people who were working in the laboratories, it was still a challenge to think about sharing everything. So we succeeded. What were the key things in getting initial LIGO off the ground? The scientific trailblazers, this, this Ray, Ray and Kip, they had the vision, determination, and the complete investment in LIGO. This is what they knew had to be done. They realized that they didn't have the skills to lead the project. That requires a certain amount of, of humility, in fact. And happily, we also have programmatic leaders. Uh, different people at different times came along and made it possible for Robbie Vogt and, and Barry Barish, to name names, made it possible for us to gather together and work in a coherent way. Um, there was first the challenge of getting the MIT and Caltech groups to form a single team, and then providing the management expertise that was required to spend several hundred million dollars of your money wisely. We have a very strong central laboratory oriented around MIT and Caltech. We provide the infrastructure, the engineering resources, and the management. And there's been very strong institutional support at Caltech. It's now matched by MIT's institutional uh, support. Caltech did it first. Um, and then enabling groups outside of MIT and Caltech to, to contribute beyond their size. That is to say, the central laboratory provides services to the greater community that they can't afford to have, wouldn't be economically reasonable for them to carry, like engineering, and we enable them to, to, to um, realize dreams that they couldn't otherwise. And then we had the funding agency. Uh, Franz Cordoba is here, thank you very much. Um, we have been, that they've been inspired and committed to the success of the LIGO project from the beginning to the end. What were the key early difficulties? I've touched on them. Getting working scientists to share information freely, th both things that worked and things that didn't work. You can learn so much by telling other scientists, I can't get this to go, and finding that they've already solved the problem or they have some ideas for you. To focus on the important tasks is determined by the leadership. This is a code word for abandoning your favorite thing if it's not relevant to the key question that must be solved and then to adopt the formalities of reporting progress. Um, if you're spending hundreds of millions of dollars, you've got to explain exactly what you've done with that money. After some bumps in the road and adapting the organization, um, the NSF decided it was appropriate to support uh, LIGO, and this is what we were able to build. This is our observatory in um, Livingston, uh, Louisiana, and here it is in Hanford, Washington. These are now the arms which are not one or 10 meters long, but four kilometers long. You can see they're covered with a concrete cover to protect them, but inside there's a vacuum tube which allows the laser light to travel without fluctuations from the atmosphere. We have very sophisticated laser systems and optical systems. We have a control center, but then perhaps the most important thing is we have human resources. In particular, we have young human resources. We've been able to provide an environment where people who can walk in and learn this new field and feel like they're really part of the adventure. So we have these two observatories, one in Washington, one in Louisiana. This distance helps us localize sources. It was put together by Caltech and MIT with the very important support from the NSF. We built these detectors, um, and then we observed from 2005 to 2011, and what did we see? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> With these initial detectors, what did we do? We learned how to work together. We formed the LIGO scientific collaboration to coordinate, plan, and propose coherently to the NSF. We learned how to build and commission detectors. We learned how to analyze the data, and we created new upper limits and significant non-detections. Some people made fun of those, but they were actually interesting scientifically. But it was clear that we needed more sensitive detectors, and again, to NSF's um, complement, they realized that from the beginning. They signed up to that when they said, yes, let's do LIGO. What was our idea? To move to a detector that was 10 times more sensitive than initial LIGO. And the interesting thing is, I told you the strain falls off as 1 over R. If you double the distance to which you can see, you increase the volume of the sphere that you reach to by a factor of 2 cubed or 8. If you go up by a factor of 10 in sensitivity, there are 1,000 times as many candidate objects for making gravitational waves. And that was just our goal. Had we seen one event in initial LIGO, we would have seen 1,000 for advanced LIGO when it's fully commissioned. But well, we saw zero. So that number was a little bit in question, but we had confidence that this would take us to the point of the practicability of detection. So we had better science ideas from the detector, from this ever larger and more coherent LIGO scientific collaboration, better technology to realize the science ideas, the experience of building initial LIGO, really good systems engineering and quality assurance. Engineering matters. It's really, really important if you want to move quickly through your scientific project to, to bring engineering in at a very fundamental level. We took some 15 years of the scientific life of 100 or so of the best instrument builders on the planet, and then we had the incredible 
courage, vision, and patience on the part of the NSF. Um, we started out with this idea of a Michelson interferometer. You map that into an optical layout, you put it inside a vacuum system, and then you try to figure out how to get all the parts onto the optical tables without um, getting in the way of the beams. It's a really complex project. But 1.3 billion years after these black holes merged, and interestingly, about the same time that cells on the Earth were circling around each other and joining together to make multicellular life, I love that parallel, 100 years after Einstein predicted gravitational waves, 50 years after Ray Weiss invented detectors, 20 years after the NSF, MIT, and Caltech founded LIGO, 10 years after advanced LIGO got the OK, and six months after we started our detector tuning, the commissioning process to bring them to the requisite sensitivity, and two days after we turned on the instruments to observe, we saw our signal. Um, this is part, a snippet of the black hole uh, simulation that I showed you, and that's just about the moment that we see here. This is time, tenth of a second on this scale, and this is the stretching and compressing of space, and in fact these tick marks are at that 10 to the minus 21 level that I told you. And what you see here are the outputs of the two um, separated detectors. They're shifted in time a bit because it first hit one detector and then the other. But you can see this beautiful signal, which corresponds very nicely, beautifully, to the calculations that are made based on Einstein's theory. We detected gravitational waves. I have something which um, I think is a, it's, it's a fun, different way of looking at this. Here again, we have time. And on the vertical scale for the color map here, we have frequency. It's a spectrogram, something I'm sure very many of you are familiar with. And I'm going to play for you over the loudspeakers the electrical signal in our photodiodes then converted into audio by the loudspeakers in this room. And that is the, the, that's a sonification of the stretching and squeezing of space-time as detected by the gravitational wave detectors that we built. Um, so again, stressing how well this matches general relativity, this is our signal. This is the best fit solution to two black holes spinning around each other using Einstein's theory, nothing more elaborate than that, and numerical relativity, which is quite a challenge in terms of the computation. You subtract this expected signal from this thing here, and to, within statistical uncertainties, we see absolutely no remnant. Einstein's theory is, to the extent that we can measure it, perfect. What a, what a visionary. Um, then there's this other last thing, I have to stress it once again. LIGO can actually measure the change in distance between the optics due to the passing um, ripple of space-time. We built things with our hands. I put my hands on those optics and placed them into the vacuum system. Okay, very, very good technicians did it. I didn't do it. I wouldn't be trusted with that thing. But we actually touched the objects, created the objects that could sense this crazy thing out in space, this distortion of space-time. That, that it never, never ceases to amaze me. And we were ready to meet that cosmic rendezvous because of the nature of the LIGO laboratory and the LIGO scientific collaboration. So what are the key features of this collaboration? We have a strong central laboratory, 150 persons roughly, Caltech and MIT, and the two observatories, the campuses and the observatories, the LIGO instruments and the observatories housing them, these engineering computing, computing resources, and then scientific and engineering management. Again, I want to come back to this again. To get people to work coherently, you need to give them coherent direction. LIGO scientific collaboration is about 1,000 persons at this point. We have an elected spokesperson, working group structure with leadership with a certain amount of authority um, based, based on their, their reputations. There's a very highly international membership. I'll show you a map on the next page. And then we have rewards for membership. We have immediate access to the data as it comes off out of the, uh, the photodiode. We have access to the expertise in the central infrastructure for people doing R&D on yet more advanced detectors. And we have the leverage of small group effort by the larger group effort. It's really constructive, collaborative effort. We have a set of co collaboration tools that are very important. A common document repository, a place that anybody can go anytime and search on keywords and find the data which are available in our domain. Very, very useful. We have telecom voice and document sharing to uh, bridge con uh, continents um, and a, a, a round the clock uh, sequence of, of meetings that take place over voice. We don't like video for some reason, I don't know. We have closed meetings of the entire collaboration. And these closed meetings are useful because that's where you can talk about what doesn't work. You can talk about new ideas that you have that aren't ready to be shared um, with the larger scientific community, but which you want to share with your closer collaborators to get them shot down, encouraged, or you can find other collaborators to work with you. So some kind of wall is a very useful thing for us.
We have shared data and expertise with our European Virgo collaboration. All of the worldwide efforts are working together and not in competition in this field. And then we have this uh, supportive funding agency in the form of the NSF. This is what our membership looks like. We have about 1,000 members, as I said, more than 90 institutions in 16 countries are focused on the two LIGO detectors. Um, in fact, though, there's this larger world around us. In addition to the two LIGO detectors, we also have Advanced Virgo, which is a French-Italian but now more pan-European detector, which is a little bit behind us but which we hope will join us in our next science run uh, in early 2017. We have LIGO India. The NSF built for us three instruments because we originally planned to ins install two here in Hanford. But um, a previous director, Jay Marks, had the inspiration that if you can take a detector and put it outside of the effective plane of the other detectors, your ability to localize in the sky is far improved. And so in working with the Indian government, they are going to build an infrastructure which will house this third detector. And when it's ready, um, the NSF will give permission for us to move it from its storage containers here and install it here. And then last but not least, there's a Japanese project, um, underground cryogenic, really groundbreaking in terms of the technology. All of these projects intend to collaborate, share their data, and get more scientific output, not only from the, um, not only from the instruments themselves, but also from the human resources which are available. So that's my story. Um, 1.3 billion years ago, a pair of black holes coalesced. We had the brilliance of Albert Einstein I love this photograph because it looks like he knew exactly how this is all going to work out. <laughs> um, which then led to our, our discovery here, and, and clearly possible not only through the individuals, um, like, like Ray and Kip and, and uh, Albert Einstein, but then also this greater collaboration and community. Thank you. Thank you. Now we're going to turn our attention to the existing um, brain projects and brain initiatives around the world. We're starting with the governmental uh, sponsored ones, and our first speaker is Jim Olds, uh, who's going to talk on behalf of the NSF in the U.S. Thank you, Rahil, and thank you, Corey, for your tremendous efforts. This is really an exciting day. Um, I'm pleased to be here because I was trained as a neuroscientist, and it's fantastic to see something like this happen. When Congress directed us to move in this direction, um, I saw it as a, a, a real turning moment. As I mentioned in a recent Nature comment piece, there is a need for continuous global investment in neuroscience, and I see each country that is represented here today as a member of a team as this most, must certainly be a coordinated effort. We can see that all great complicated problems, uh, gravitational waves to the complexity of, of the human brain, really require that kind of team approach. <clears throat> Let me tell you about what we do at the NSF with regard to the Brain Initiative. As you know, the NSF is the science agency in the United States that supports basic scientific research. There is no intramural research component. The NSF has a budget request from the president of approximately $8 billion for fiscal year 17. Of the NSF's three strategic goals in its strategic plan, the first is to, quote, transform the frontiers of science and engineering, unquote. And this is what we seek to achieve in the context of the Brain Initiative. Our approach to neuroscience is multi-directorate. We have all of these disciplines of science and technology represented under one roof. Understanding the brain is not a problem of biology alone, but one that can best be furthered with insights from physics, mathematics, chemistry, material science, engineering, and computer science. By choosing challenges in neuroscience that demand expertise in all of these areas, we at NSF seek to promote convergent neuroscience in which disciplinary boundaries are invisible and conceptual discoveries and breakthroughs in our understanding of brain function are accelerated to an unprecedented pace. We're distinct from our colleagues at NIH 
and that you won't see brain diseases like Alzheimer's or Parkinson's up here. But what you will see is a holistic approach to understanding the healthy brain. And it encompasses one high-level goal that drives many of our brain-related funding activities. We believe that multi-scale integration of the dynamic structure and activity of the brain is a key for understanding how the brain functions to control behavior and cognition. To integrate the multimodal data across scales, we must promote the development of neurotechnologies, infrastructure, theory and modeling of brain function, as well as train a new generation of researchers for the future workforce. Then we can look ahead to brain-inspired concepts and designs, which will likely have profound effects on society. NSF is a serious player in this research effort. The NSF has increased its funding to approximately $75 million annually for the Brain Initiative and hopes to double this number moving into the future. Most of our activities under the Brain Initiative to date have supported projects that advance our understanding of the function of neural circuits across the phylogenetic spectrum, while at the same time fostering integrative approaches to tackle compelling questions in the field. As new innovative technologies to lead, lead to new discoveries about brain structure, research on brain function and activity will lead to better understanding of behavior and cognition. NSF realizes the need to share and standardize and utilize uh, tools across research uh, disciplines. We have described a phased community-driven approach to doing this in uh, this Dear Colleague letter, um, and our approaches have referred to this effort as a, a National Brain Observatory, while some in the community have refer, referred to this as an International Brain Station. NSF understands the need to maintain a broad spectrum of funding mechanisms to ensure the most innovative and creative ideas receive the support they need. Through the BRAIN Initiative, we have called for early concept grants for exploratory research, those are called eager awards, ideas labs, and solicitations for integrative strategies to understanding uh, neural and cognitive systems. Our neuro newest call, Neuronex, is a highly flexible mechanism designed to solicit proposals that will develop and disseminate innovative neurotechnologies and or theoretical frameworks that will transform our understanding of the linkages between neural activity and cognition and behavior across different systems, environments, and species, while also providing an avenue for widespread dissemination of these technologies and theoretical frameworks, as well as broad training opportunities for junior folks. Two weeks ago, we received letters of interest for 134 Neuronext projects. We will use this solicitation in the future to invite foreign and private partners to help us accelerate the dissemination of neurotechnologies and theoretical frameworks across the globe. Thank you for your attention, and I'm really excited about today. Thank you, Jim. Now, uh, on behalf of the NIH, uh, let me introduce Walter Korocek, uh, director of NINDS. Hey, thanks very much, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, I want to give a brief overview of where we are from the NIH's uh, funding of the Brain Initiative projects. And I uh, hope that Josh Gordon's in the audience, he's a new co-director, just the new, just announced as a new uh, Institute Director for National Institute of Mental Health. So together we'll be working this forward. Um, so the Brain Initiative is, on, is focused on developing neurotechnologies to try to understand uh, how brain circuits work. Uh, this has many implications for basic science, but from the clinical side, I wanted to say that we've been held back in trying to understand disorders of the nervous system because we do not have the technologies necessary to see what the circuit dysfunction is. We don't understand them. The technologies we're using are primarily EEG from the 1920s, fMRI, which has lots of problems with uh, temporal and spatial 
uh, performance, and so we really need new technologies to try and bridge the gap between what we know about the molecular basis of disease and what actually happens to the patient, because in between that is circuit dysfunction. That is the, the, the core on, on which uh, uh, the patient's disability stands, and that's what we really need to understand to make a difference for patients moving forward. The NIH Brain Initiative is uh, directed by a, a very scholarly report called Brain 2025, uh, put together by a committee of folks who really took off their hats and tried to look at the future and give us guide, guide for how we might develop these technologies in what space and for what purpose. Uh, there are basically seven priority areas. The first is discovering diversity. If you think of the brain as a large, very effective computer, the first thing you want to know is what are the components, what are the different cell types in the brain, how are they connected, what are their properties. So deep phenotyping of the different cell types uh, called undis discovering diversity. The brain is an uh, information processing machine. It's doing this at multiple different scales. Uh, at very low level scales, micron level, where a uh, synapse occurs and information crosses from one cell to another, to a whole network of bordering cells that are interconnected to those cells connected to many other nuclei throughout the brain. And so when we perform an action, it's not coming out of one particular area. It's a network activity. And trying to understand the brain at these multiple scales is probably the most daunting task. I wish Einstein had put his effort on this problem. <laughs> Because this is a really tough problem. I know the gravitational waves are, are kind of nice, but this is a tough problem. <laughs> what we want to understand is how these circuits create behavior. So I'm talking now, you're thinking now, maybe you're looking at your iPhone. Your brain networks are, are generating that behavior. How do, we, how do we do that? So to get a dynamic picture of the brain, functioning brain, to know what the information processing that's going on that's responsible for our behaviors, but not just sticking with some association. I see this kind of activity, I see this kind of behavior, but to actually get the causality. We now have the tools now where we can actually measure thousands and thousands of neurons and their activity during a behavior, develop a model that we think then causes that behavior, but then prove it by targeting specific neuronal subtypes to disturb the circuit and try and predict what that would be on behavior. So that's getting at causality. We think that our understanding of brain activity is, is incredibly rudimentary in terms of its, uh, in, in terms of the network principles that underlie behavior. Uh, we have been, Rafa talks about this, about we've been trying to understand how gone with the, what gone with the wind is by watching it one pixel at a time over and over again. Good luck trying to figure out what that movie's about if you can only see one pixel at a time. We need to see thousands and thousands of pixels at a time to understand what are the fundamental principles by which that network activity gives rise to behavior. And we don't have the tools to do that, although they look like they're coming. Finally, from the National Institute of Health, our purpose is to, to decrease the burden of dis disease due to psychiatric and neurological disorders, substance abuse disorders. These are, many of these are inherently circuit disorders, some of which have no pathology that we underlie that we know underlies them. It's purely getting at the circuits that's going to tell us about schizophrenia, autism, multiple psychiatric disorders. <coughs> and in neurologic disorders, we have examples where by pure luck, well, not quite luck, people did have an understanding of basal ganglia circuits, but it's amazing that you could stick a wire into the brain of someone who has Parkinson's disease, turn on electric current, and their symptoms go away because you, you have proof that by intervening in these circuits, you can have tremendous public health uh, advance. And we need to do this for the other disorders. So here, here is where we are now. Um, so we have the President announced in the Brain Initiative. We have a multi-council working group that then oversees our, our, uh, our, our work. Um, we had a uh, first round of brain awards in September of 2014. So these awards have only been out for a short period of time. We have brain PI meetings with National Science Foundation and the NIH investigators uh, where we get people together. And the next one, we're trying to expand and actually reach out uh, internationally and uh, to, the, to the general public about what the Brain Initiative is. The Brain Initiative Alliance, Cavley, Simons, all the federal partners, Janelia, Allen Brain Institute, have come together to work and coordinate our activities, but also to communicate as a group uh, called the Brain Initiative Alliance. 
Uh, neuroethics, there are serious neuroethical issues that we are going to bring to the forefront for society to think about. Uh, the European Brain Initiative and the U.S. have neuroethics teams that are working in this space. But this is going to be quite important moving forward because as we understand brain activity in humans, if we can measure it, if we can intervene, these are things that are getting at, um, you know, what makes us human, whose identity is it, uh, and who's, who owns this kind of information in terms of what's coming out of people's brain activity. Uh, we have a second uh, Brain PI meeting in December. Third round of Brain Awards are just coming out, and the third PI meeting is in December in, in Bethesda. This is where the money's gone. Here's uh, millions of dollars on the y-axis, the different years. And uh, Amy Adams, who is our uh, outreach, head of our outreach for Brain, uh, has a very interesting color coding system where you can see where the different uh, bins of funds have gone. And for 17, we're working in the same bins, but we have a couple of projects where we're moving from the investigator-initiated small teams to try and get large teams to form. It's not quite LIGO, but it's a step forward in neuroscience, which is really quite new to this uh, area. Uh, lots of things have happened. There's been very interesting uh, results and technologies that have kind of come out of the woodwork and quite surprising how good they are performing. Uh, so we're quite excited about how things are going. I'm just going to end with this. It's an example of how when you build new technologies, you can never know what the results are going to be. So Arnold Krigstein working in the cell census, looking at fetal brain tissue, identified a radial glial cell that gives rise to the cells that form the cortex. Turns out in that transcriptome analysis, he found those cells have a receptor for the Zika virus. So here, something quite unexpected, but this is what you can predict will happen as these new technologies come along. Really great things. You don't know where they're coming from. I encourage people who are at Society for Neuroscience to come to our Brain Initiative Alliance uh, session. And uh, thanks very much. So our next speaker is Jason Matheny, representing the director of the Intelligence Advanced Research Projects Agency of the United States. Jason. I love this format. It's sort of like international speed dating. <laughs> uh, so I come from IARPA, which is uh, an advanced research and development funding organization uh, for the intelligence community in the United States. So you, you might think that we're especially then secretive, uh, but actually most of what we do is unclassified, openly published. We're probably best known for our research in high performance computing, uh, machine learning, and research on human judgment. Uh, but we also spend over $40 million a year on research in applied neuroscience. That's uh, aligned with the Brain Initiative. Uh, so I'll tell you a little bit about what we're funding right now and some opportunities to partner with us. Um, we, we fund uh, research in, uh, in, uh, in over uh, 300 universities, colleges, uh, companies, NGOs, and over a dozen countries uh, around the world. Um, our work in neuroscience uh, involves several of the countries represented here and many of the universities represented here. Uh, our research programs in neuroscience right now are large, multi-year, multi-site programs. We typically uh, spend something on the order of, of 10 to $20 million per year per program. Uh, right now, our investments aligned with the Brain Initiative are split across three programs. Uh, one called Microns, led by Jacob Fogelstein, is focused on reverse engineering the cortical circuits uh, of the neocortex in order to understand uh, the problems that uh, Tom described earlier, how is it that the human brain is able to process information so efficiently, uh, both in terms of energy efficiency as well as in terms of sparse data? Uh, and that program uh, involves over 20 universities and companies in, in three countries. Uh, the uh, SHARP program, led by Alexis Janot, uh, is focused on uh, safe, non-invasive neurotechnologies uh, for uh, cognitive enhancement in healthy adults. Uh, human judgment features prominently in intelligence analysis, so finding ways of uh, boosting the pattern recognition ability 
of high-performing adults is, is a priority for us. Uh, that program uh, involves uh, over a dozen universities and companies uh, in three countries in the world. Uh, lastly, our, um, our Kearns program, Knowledge Representation and Neural Systems, uh, led also by Jacob Fogelstein, uh, is focused on uh, uh, the problem of how the human brain encodes and represents concepts. Uh, and that work is now, I think, um, entering uh, its next to last year. Uh, and involves, I believe, five universities uh, and other organizations uh, in two different countries. Uh, so there, there are multiple ways for uh, international partnerships in our work. Uh, the first is that we are openly publishing not only the results, but also the data uh, that result from our research investments. So if you go to our website at IARPA.gov, uh, you can find links to uh, results and data. Uh, you'll also find that um, we have open solicitations for, uh, for research uh, that are open year-round, um, including those not only aligned with, with our research programs, but also those that we call seedlings that are meant to lay the groundwork for future research investments. Uh, you, can, um, you can have informal discussions with our program managers uh, well in advance of submitting a formal proposal, which uh, reduces the amount of work on your end and I think brings sort of the success rate of proposal acceptance by something like 5% to around 80%. Um, lastly, you can follow us on Twitter, uh, which is odd for an intelligence organization, uh, but I recommend it. it. It's a way for, uh, for tracking what, uh, what new research solicitations uh, we're putting out. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Uh, now we turn our attention to what's going on in Europe. And uh, to lead off the European contingent, we have Karim Berkouk, the Deputy Head of Research and Innovation of the European Commission. Welcome. Good morning, everybody. I'm Karim Berkouk from the European Commission. And we work on um, non-communicable diseases and the challenge of uh, healthy aging. First of all, thank you for inviting us for this uh, event, which is uh, extremely timely. And I will speak about the AU effort in uh, brain research. We all agree that brain represents one of the biggest research challenges of the 21st century. In particular, it's dual challenge. In one hand, we need to understand the physiological mechanism underlying the normal functioning of the brain, such as how does it develop, uh, how does he control the whole body? What is memory, etc.? But on the other hand, this functioning of normal brain provokes a huge uh, global health uh, challenge to all ages. Uh, with brain-related disorders, um, babies, children, teenagers, adults, the elderly population all have their specific disease. In Europe, in Europe we have uh, 179 million that are affected by uh, brain um, disease diseases, and we spend something like eight, 800 billion a year on that. The lack of understanding of the brain contributes uh, greatly to the high attrition rates in drug development, especially in Alzheimer's disease, as you see on the, on the bottom right. Uh, only 0.5% of the drug uh, developed make it to the market. To address uh, this uh, dual challenge, the EU has built a strategic brain research portfolio which addressed the continuum from uh, better knowledge to uh, delivery of care. The keywords of uh, AU research is, re is about collaborations and partnerships. Uh, collabor collaborative research is a hallmark of uh, AU uh, research. This all started for political reasons when Europe was building itself, but um, it, it was meant to uh, strive a European cohesion and it ended up uh, being a very sound scientific solution with uh, the best researchers in Europe uh, working together uh, around the project uh, with uh, complementary expertise. We have built also the public-private partnership in health research, which is called uh, the um, in, um, Innovative Medicine Initiative, which is the dedicated to speed up uh, drug, de um, uh, drug de uh, delivery and uh, innovative, um, innovative uh, therapy, sorry. 
And we have also the public-public partnership where the, the, the European Union works with the member states in order to coordinate and uh, align uh, national strategies. We also work with uh, international funders like the NIH, the Canadian, through uh, international research cooperation. We have that on uh, the Global Alliance for Chronic Diseases, where the next call uh, would be on um, mental disorder and in the, the Traumatic Brain Injury Initiative. And of course, we have the ICT-based uh, uh, research infrastructure, the Human, Human Brain Project. And I will go very quickly to each of these um, to explain what they are. But first of all, uh, I would like to emphasize that the overarching driver of uh, AU research now is uh, personalized medicine or precision medicine, how you call it here. We exploit personalized medicine potential to develop a medicine which is based on data and not on, sim on symptoms. And uh, personalized medicine affects the whole cycle of uh, research and innovation. We use it for def uh, def defining new taxonomy uh, and to stratify patients for better prevention, diagnosis, prognosis, and uh, treatments. In our collaborative research, for instance, in uh, what the, the seventh framework pro program, which was the uh, financial arm of uh, the European Union, which ran from 2007 to 2013, we have put some uh, 3 billion euros in, in brain research, going through uh, from collaborative research, uh, blue sky research, but also training and uh, mobility grants. And you will see in which area we have put that on the graph on the left, and you will, you will see that 40% went to understanding the brain, while the rest went, um, was targeting diseases. And through this collaboration, we have created uh, almost 20,000 connections between partners of the, um, of the project. And just one slide to say some of the results of um, uh, the closed uh, research project, for instance, we, uh, the 100 um, projects on brain research uh, were closed. They generated uh, knowledge with uh, more than 4,000 uh, publications with an average impact factor of nine. And they created also innovation through uh, patent applications and, um, and spin-offs. The Innovative Medicine Initiative has pioneered a new scale of public-private uh, partnership between the European Commission and the pharmaceutical industry. It's also uh, contributed in rever reversing the trend of, uh, for large uh, in, uh, pharmaceutical industry to leave brain research, which was the case in the last uh, 10 years. And basically, it has helped uh, in de-risking or sharing the risk in drug development in areas such as the brain. Uh, neurodegenerative disease is high on the agenda of uh, IMI, and they have made an uh, Alzheimer platform in 2015. For instance, one of the projects, the European Medical Information Framework, IMIF, uh, is developing a platform for the reuse of medical data, connecting data of more than 53 million uh, individuals. You may know that uh, at European level, uh, we actually um, manage 5% of the R&D expenditure in Europe. The 95% remaining are in the member states. In that context, it's very important to um, implement and define strategies that are convergent uh, throughout Europe. And we do that, for instance, with the joint pro programming uh, initiative on uh, neurodegenerative diseases. Um, this approach can make greater impacts more quickly and reduce uh, wasteful uh, duplication. The GPND on neurodegenerative medicine has invested some uh, more than 110 million euro now. And we have another um, area where countries put money together in neuroscience, in neuron. And there we have, uh, they have invested 80 million so far. And of course, we have uh, the Human Brain Project, which is uh, as the digital era is accelerating its pace, we have to make uh, sure that digital technology is used for the full potential to address um, societal challenges. Uh, so it's really a federa uh, federated uh, infrastructure all, or, uh, all around uh, Europe, but I won't say much about that because we have the next speaker, uh, the executive director, Mr. Eber, who will speak about that. And to finish off, uh, I will say that uh, what is um, the EU offering in, um, in, in brain research? So it's a network uh, of uh, collaborative uh, research, a public-private partnership, an established framework for um, countries to coordinate their, um, their research, strong experience in uh, international cooperation, and uh, an ICT infrastructure for brain research. 
And we firm, firmly believe that uh, if we manage to federate all these uh, large-scale brain initiatives worldwide, we will further accelerate uh, global progress and uh, boost impact. We will then contribute to reducing the dual challenge into a single one on the healthy brains. Thank you very much. Our next speaker um, is the executive director of the Human Brain Project of the EU, uh, Christoph Ebel. Thank you. All right. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Chris Ebel. Uh, I'm directing the, the management, the coordination of the Human Brain Project um, that was just mentioned. Um, I would like to give you a quick overview on what the, uh, what the project is, where it is right now, where we're going, and also um, how we can uh, collaborate since this is a coordination uh, meeting. Um, the aim of the, uh, of the HVP um, is described on this, uh, on this slide, and uh, you will see that there are multiple uh, components to that. Um, the, the real fundamental driver, I believe, is uh, that the, uh, this infrastructure is going to um, help accelerate brain research and cognitive neuroscience. Um, it will not only do that, but it also under, help by understanding or helping to understand how the brain actually works um, in uh, terms of uh, reproducing certain elements of it in, in an ICT environment. Um, I think um, it, will, it will actually be an infrastructure in a couple of years from now that can help everyone's efforts around the world uh, and uh, exchange those, um, uh, d those efforts uh, much, much better. Um, the, uh, the, 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 the focus really on, a, um, on an infrastructure is something that um, helped us focus a lot of our effort. And um, I was very appreciative of the, uh, of the talk by, uh, by a colleague from, from LEGO because I think the um, the challenges are very similar, and, uh, and I think we should have talked earlier, actually, because <laughs> we could have avoided some of the, uh, the problems we had, um, or about, well, let's say, childhood diseases. Um, let me just go quickly through, the, uh, through where we're coming from here. Um, the, the project, just to give you an, an idea of the size, and I mean, some of these are actually comparable, I think, uh, to what we've seen. Um, the, the, nomin the nominal funding is about a billion euros over 10 years. Uh, as as um, a previous speaker said, a combination of um, of public and uh, of public funding from the com uh, from the European Commission and public funding from the from the member states, but increasing industry participation as well. Um, uh, it's uh, it's 120 partners uh, in in 21 countries, uh, about a thousand uh, researchers roughly in, involved there. Um, the uh, you can see here a little bit the um, uh, the evolving. Uh, situation we have uh, we started in 2013 um, with an initial uh, ramp up phase uh, went through the, uh, the roadmap um, re redesigned basically uh, to kind of bring in the, the, the um, what we learned in the first two years and that's really where we are currently we have um, uh, a revised uh, ro uh, scientific roadmap which is uh, available on our website um, we have um, also adjusted uh, and, and revised and rebuilt our whole governance system to actually adapt to that uh, infrastructure challenge much better. Um, we have uh, agreed with the Commission, uh, the European Commission, and our, and our partners in the member states uh, on, a, on an agenda, and we got this agenda funded. So this is, uh, I think, a very, very good moment, actually, to talk, uh, to coordinate uh, with other brand initiatives around the, uh, the world, especially also with, the, uh, with, with you here today. Um, let's just have a quick look on the, at the HP um, uh, infrastructure. I call it the SRI for service-based research infrastructure. Okay, <laughs> so this is um, it is not obviously uh, a computer that sits somewhere and uh, where brain simulation runs on it, uh, but it's um, it's a federated infrastructure, and you can see a little bit how it's structured here. Um, it's, okay, that's the beam here, right? No, it's not. Okay, um, here uh, the the access here and. In principle, this is what, what our product will look like to the outside world um, uh, with a web, web accessible collaborative hub uh, with an entry point for all the, uh, the, the platforms from, uh, from brain simulation to neuromorphic platforms. Um, basically, this is where, where the researchers, where brain research, neuroscientists, uh, industry can go in and utilize the infrastructure. Um, what we're doing right now, I mean, this is in the building phase, right? We are two years into the project. What we're doing now is um, integrating the components of base infrastructure, that means high-performance computing, those, uh, the networks that we have in Europe, 
uh, the big infrastructures that we have, the high-performance computing infrastructures, with um, a set of uh, software custom-built services that will actually um, bring out the, uh, those, uh, those research offerings that um, the, the infrastructure will provide. And this is in development, and it is in development with the scientific community. In this sense, it is also a scientific project, obviously, because um, none of this actually is useful if it's not co-designed with, uh, with the end user, with the scientists, um, who are going to actually use this in mind. Um, they have to be part of this process. Um, as you can see, the, uh, the core project, the project that's funded by the Commission, and here's again the link to a strong uh, funding agency, in this case the European Commission, who has a commitment uh, to that, a long-term commitment that's absolutely essential uh, for, for bringing this forward. Um, but we have to integrate it with, with national um, components, um, and that's the, that's the actual engineering package, I think, that we are now uh, starting to deploy and deliver. Um, what we're also doing is a an user engagement strategy because obviously we have to uh, we have to balance carefully and and successfully the, the the technology push and the and the demand side. So so the supply and the demand side have to be matched in a in a meaningful way. Um, and finally, I think here uh, what we're doing today is really the the smart integration with global initiatives on on multiple levels. Um, when I say multiple levels, I mean really from the from the individual PI. Uh, from labs up to uh, policy integration on the on the top level of, of the uh, of the agencies involved. Um, here's a rough roadmap, and um, you can see we're up. We're, we're right now. This is the infrastructure roadmap that we have. Very rough. Uh, we are basically at this level here, the prototype research infrastructure. We right now have a small user base. We are working with those people very closely. Um, they're getting all the support they need. Their 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 friends and family all, almost at this point. Um, at this, um, we're mer this is kind of our midterm goal here, and obviously in about seven to eight to ten years, we're going to be in this, um, in this area, hopefully. Um, so basically, at this point, again, we are at a very, very um, good point in time for starting the collaborations with the other global brain, brain initiatives to make sure that we are, in fact, also adapting to what they need and um, they adapting to what we need. So there is a certain um, need now for, for, for this convergence. Um, the next steps for us um, is also to create this uh, a structure, a home, so to speak, for this infrastructure, which is a, 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 leg um, some, a legal entity, sort of a, um, uh, an international organization, uh, which will help us to coordinate the, the national and the, and the international components in one uh, coherent infrastructure offering. Um, <coughs> Coordination with global initiatives here. This is uh, my, my last slide here. Um, on, on many different ways, we have uh, different areas of engagement on the user ba base, what I talked about before, this, uh, the demand side. Co-designing, absolutely essential right now. Um, there can be component or base uh, service suppliers, data supply, uh, data sharing, and of course, um, on, the, on the more policy level or research policy level, uh, joint road mapping uh, where, where appropriate. Um, so I think that's um, for uh, from my side. That's the uh, that's the uh, the Human Brain Project in a nutshell, and um, we'll look at the uh, the scientific uh, side of that in, a, in just a minute. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is the scientific director of the Human Brain Project of the EU, Katrin Amunds. Okay, so hello everybody, and uh, I would like to introduce a scientific part of this project. And um, the, I mean, the understanding of the human brain is one of our greatest challenges that we are facing now, and we need or we want to understand it because we want to get more insight into basic neuroscientific questions, but we also want to understand what makes us humans. Uh, we want to help, at the end, patients uh, with neurological and psychiatric diseases, and we would also like um, to uh, contribute to develop new technologies, brain-inspired technologies in this field. And you have heard in the last talk um, more about the structure of the human brain, and um, you can see, of course, on our website uh, how the project is structured, um, the major uh, components these are uh, 12 scientific sub-projects. 
And in the following, uh, I will give you some concrete examples illustrating what are the challenges, what are the needs, and what, where are perhaps uh, the contact points. And I would like to, like to start from the fact that the brain has a multi-level and multi-scale organization. And I think this is really crucial uh, to have this in mind. And uh, the brain has different levels of organization and space, as you can see here, from the microscopical level uh, down to the molecular architecture. And even at each spatial level, there are different aspects which contribute to brain organization. And of course, a, a way to integrate these different levels of brain organization is to have an atlas. And uh, such an atlas uh, should be multimodal. It should be multi-scale. And it is also clo uh, clear that this is not just a viewer, but there is a database behind it. And uh, that there is a strategy and neuroinformatics tools that enable uh, to integrate this data, to collect it, but also to share this data with, uh, with other communities. And um, that means that such an atlas will have, of course, uh, different uh, aspects included, which are um, um, represented in this atlas uh, according to the brain topography. And again, I think this is a very crucial point because the brain has this very spatial type of organization um, and uh, Knowing it and representing the different aspects of brain organization helps us uh, to make interferences between uh, the different fields. So how do we want to address this uh, multi-level uh, system? Well, we have uh, three or four uh, neuroscience projects which are dealing with the mouse brain, the human brain, and uh, cognitive systems. There is a mathematical and theory sub-project which is uh, providing the theoretical foundations of brain research. And we have um, infrastructure or ICT platform sub-projects, uh, which are neuroinformatics, simulation, high performance computing and analytics, medical informatics, neuromorphic computing, and robotics. And to integrate, again, these, uh, uh, so to say, these columns, uh, we have um, uh, develop co-design projects that bring together uh, neuroscientists on the one hand and uh, developers of uh, the infrastructure on the other hand. So let me provide now concrete examples how this works. So if you have a look, for instance, at the synaptic uh, level of organization, then uh, our colleagues uh, from Spain in particular, Javier de Filipe, is analyzing, for instance, uh, the dendrites and the, sp uh, and the spines and uh, the morphology of the spines directly reflects its function. And I think this is a very nice example that structure and function, of course, are only one side uh, or two, two sides of one and the same um, uh, aspect of brain organization. And very often, it's not possible to tease apart uh, these two aspects. So we would like to address both the structure and the function because we do not think that uh, it makes sense and it's possible always uh, to subdivide it. And when we go to the higher level uh, to the dendritic and axonal architecture. Uh, then uh, Heip Mansfelder, uh, for instance, in collaboration with Jedan Seges, they are analyzing the morphology of, uh, new, uh, of neurons in the human brain and in the mouse brain. And based on the morphology of the segments of dendrites uh, in human neurons and in mouse neurons, they come up with a model and then simulate uh, how the activity of this neuron can be predicted based on the morphological features. And they find interesting, um, they find interesting differences between mouse brain and uh, human brain neurons, which are functionally relevant. So I think one of the major um, foci that we uh, should address in our brain initiatives is uh, to be clear what are the differences and what are the similarities uh, across the different species. So when we can get um, examples of knowledge uh, from the mouse brain, this is of course fine, but we should precisely understand for each application uh, what can be delivered, what can be applied for the human brain based, for instance, on mouse brain um, studies. And um, 
Here you see an example uh, using 3D polarized light imaging for revealing the axonal architecture in the brain, how we can use one and the same method uh, in different species in order to uh, discuss in more detail um, homologies or analogies, uh, better to say. And uh, when it comes to the human brain architecture uh, of the connectivity, and this is one of the really difficult uh, um, challenges that we have in human brain research, we are facing, of course, uh, the problem of a huge amount of different data. And here you see an example of a human brain section, and the color codes uh, the direction of fiber tracts running uh, um, in the brain in this particular section, but in 3D. So the, the more black uh, the dots are, the more, uh, the, uh, the more is the inclination in the sections, and the other colors indicate what is the direction of fibers uh, in the other directions. So having such a method, we are able now for the first time, uh, I think, to go to the uh, 3D architecture of a full human brain uh, connectome. And this is accompanied, of course, uh, with lots of data, so 40 gigabyte if we have uh, only one single section, and we have about 3,000 for one single brain. So we have to develop workflows based on high-performance computing, and uh, we use the supercomputers, uh, which are part of the Praise network uh, in Jülich, in, uh, in Switzerland, uh, but also in, in Barcelona. And we are developing new workflows that allow us to significantly speed up uh, the analysis of fiber tracts in the human brain. And um, here is the last example where we have um, 3D reconstructed uh, the basal ganglia, the striatum, in a vervet brain monkey. And what you see here really is a stack of images showing all the nice details uh, that we can see in the striatum and now really to, to go back uh, to higher um, resolution uh, approaches using electron microscopy, for instance, or um, modern optical images, we can bring together these different aspects uh, of connectivity in this particular brain. So for the long time, we would like to create this European uh, research uh, infrastructure to collaborate, to share. Uh, in order to achieve a better understanding of the human brain. And uh, this is also uh, having in mind that uh, we should contribute uh, to analyzing uh, the brain and its diseases. Simulation is one of the crucial uh, tools uh, to analyze the human brain, and uh, simulating and also big data analytics are only feasible when we have the right infrastructure and this is one of our major efforts in the next few years. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Catherine. Our next speaker will represent France. He's the Councillor of Science and Technology of the Embassy of France in the US, Dr. Miham Pham. Okay, so today I'm here in my capacity of Councillor for Science and Technology at the French Embassy, but my former uh, training was in neurobiology, so I'd like to thank the organizer for giving me the opportunity today to give you an overview of the involvement of French uh, research teams into brain projects. Um, so I would like first to stress out a new funding research and innovation um, um, governmental funding, which is called Investment for the, the Future. And this um, program has uh, six priorities, as you see here. But interestingly, we got up to uh, 47 billion euros, among which more than 20 billion were dedicated to higher education and research. So this has totally changed the landscape in higher education and research these last uh, uh, years. Uh, so here, you see part of this uh, money, which has been um, dedicated to neuroscience, which allow us to create a, a range of tools or to organize uh, new tools, such as uh, cohorts. I'm sorry, I'm not very good with this. 
Yes, uh, so cohorts. We also have institutes, a joint, joint institute between hospitals and universities. We have networks of technological platforms. We also have networks of uh, laboratories, uh, and you can see the map of France. As usual, it's very much concentrated uh, around Paris, but not only, also in the south of France. Uh, here you see also that we have developed 18 clinical investigation centers. Again, it's, uh, you have the map here. Um, these uh, investigation, um, clinical investigation centers are, have been created by INSERM, which is our uh, French NIH, and uh, uh, joint hospital university centers uh, for clinical protocols and uh, volunteers and patients. Um, now, as for the research teams in neuroscience, again, you see a high concentration around Paris, but also in the south of France, close to Marseille, which is a, a great center also in neuroscience in France. Um, all this activity is coordinated in France but what, by what we call uh, an alliance, Aviaison, which is for French Alliance in Life Science and Health, which gather all the um, um, research institutions, universities, uh, and also uh, um, funding agencies in charge of uh, working on life science at, at large. This alliance is um, organized into nine thematic institutes, which are virtual institutes. It's mainly networking of people. And one is dedicated to neuroscience, cognitive sciences, neurology, and psychiatry. Um, the activity of this alliance is to define priorities, and you can see here that these priorities are largely shared with what we have heard before. And the key figures I would like, well, the, the, the take home message are, are, is here. So it, um, neuroscience in France represent 20% of bio, biomedical research. We have something like 750 research teams. Uh, um, the staff is more than 5,000 people, the eight clinical investigation centers. Um, it uh, allows something like 12,000 publication per year, and uh, from this program investment of the future, we got uh, roughly 200 million euros for, for, for neuroscience. Um, now, just to open it to uh, uh, international and European uh, collaboration, uh, of course, we have the national programs, and as previously mentioned, but we are part of all the programs that have been mentioned, especially by the European Commission, and I also want to stress out a specific French-American program between ANR, which is more or less our French NSF, together with NSF, and this program is a collaborative research in computational neuroscience. Uh, and the next uh, annual meeting will be held in, in Paris in October. So if you need more information, please feel free to contact us. Thank you. Um, now speaking on behalf of the German government is uh, Dr. Benedikt Grote from uh, Ludwig Maximilian University. Hi. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. I have no slides since two days ago. Two days ago, I didn't know that I would present, but uh, it's a pleasure to do it now. Um, I'm actually talking in uh, behalf of the neuroscience uh, uh, reviewing board of the German Research Foundation, the DFG, so the equivalent of the National Science Foundation. I would like to give you a little bit of flavor about the German funding system and whether partners can be identified for the Global Brain Project. Um, the um, German system is characterized by a kind of dualistic approach. On the one hand, we have a top-down uh, funding system that goes through the federal government. You may have heard about the Ham Hotel Centers and other large-scale funding schemes. For example, the German Center for Neurodegenerative Diseases uh, is one of them. That's about 50 million per year uh, going to a central facility plus some satellites. Um, big goals, but very specific. Um, big questions, but quite specific goals. On the other hand, the federal government is also funding uh, um, or is trying to implement infrastructure where it is missing. The Bernstein Center for Computational Neuroscience and the Bernstein Network would be the prime example for me. It was missing uh, as a focus area in Germany, but 10 years ago it st we started to implement these Bernstein Centers and it's now an inherent part of the neuroscience community. It's a partner of the Human Brain Project and it's a natural partner also for any kind of global initiative. So this is kind of focus areas um, via these top-down approaches. 
On the other, on the other side, we have a strong bottom-up approach, self-organizing, purely research-driven, based on curiosity, consortia that are more or less local. They are mainly funded through the German Research uh, Foundation, the DFG, very often in very tight collaboration with the Max Planck Institutes and others um, on, on local sites. The collaborative research centers, or SFBs, are famous for that, have been ever since the Second World War. Um, the training centers and graduate schools come through such systems. And um, this is what I would like to focus on, the excellence clusters due to the excellence initiative that started about 10 years ago. Again, uh, in Germany, we have these very uh, generous and very flexible funds that go to local consortia. Again, University, Max Planck, Helmholtz, whoever is contributing. There are at least four, if not five, um, as far as I can recall, with, uh, within Germany out of about 40 plus. And the excellence initiative is going to a next phase. Um, the pre-proposals are due in March, and in 2019, the funding will start in the seven-year framework. Very generous funding and a natural partner for anything that comes through such global um, um, initiatives because it gives the necessary flexibility. Um, again, it's mostly local, it's interdisciplinary, and it's extremely flexible. Um, Finally, I would like to make a few notes out of what we discussed in uh, the reviewing board at the, at the uh, German Research Foundation um, that is also coming out of the kind of German tradition. We have learned in the last 10 years, mainly to the um, human uh, gene project, that our brain in the last 60 million, million years has been in a very specific state based on, on its genetics, based on how the mutation implemented in the genome shaped the brain as it is now. I would urge all initiatives to keep that in mind and to keep phylogeny in mind. We have to get out of the bottleneck of a few model systems. And I think um, in particularly with NSF, with partners like the DFG and under a framework of the uh, Global Brain Initiative, we could kind of get to that point that we use with modern uh, genetic tools these animals that are suitable for questions. The mouse is not possibly always the best um, model, and even the, the macaque. Um, I would also urge that we should try to not only be neurocentered. Only once a day I heard about clear cells. I think 50% plus cells in our brain deserve enough attention, although, of course, we all are more driven by understanding neurons. Finally, my last remark, let's not overstate with all the enthusiasm that we have. Um, this is a wonderful project. I think it's, it's going to get us to a new state, but let's not overstate. Let's not raise expectations by the taxpayers that we cannot meet up with. Thank you. Our next speaker will represent the UK, uh, the Head of Neuroscience and Mental Health of the MRC. Welcome. Thank you. Good morning. Um, thank you for inviting me to be here today. Um, I just wanted to speak very briefly about the Medical Research Council um, and our mission, which is about improving human health. So um, I'm going to come at this probably slightly differently from previous speakers in um, kind of outlining roughly where we sit within the kind of translational pipeline, if you like, of research. We sit probably in this kind of schematic across the middle of the, the slide here towards the left-hand end, starting from basic discovery research all the way through to kind of early clinical trials. And we partner in the UK with a number of other research councils and um, medical research charities and the Department of Health from England and the devolved nations who sort of span the um, different areas of this trajectory. I would just like to say that we do still partner with European initiatives and Europeans and we hope to continue to do so. <laughs> um, so one of the things that we do as all, all uh, fund, funding organizations I'm sure recognize is we have strategies, we are trying to articulate what these are, and we have to make an argument to government as to what it is we're going to do over set periods of time. Um, in the last spending review, we made a commitment to government that we would um, sort of look at a number of priority challenge areas, and one of those has been um, lifelong brain health, and we've made a, a large, um, 
contribution and investment in the area of dementia research, um, and I'll come back to that in a second. Another thing I think that's important, especially for this audience today, is how we kind of go about um, some of this investment, and that is through um, informatics and computation, perhaps more in the bioinformatics space than in the neuroinformatics space, but we have investments there too. And as has already been highlighted today, the importance of um, interdisciplinarity for discovery science is, is vital. Um, as I mentioned, dementia is hugely important for us um, in the, the lifelong brain health space, but we're also in, in, um, invested in the um, neurodevelopmental disorders and understanding what happens as brains develop. And actually, I think something that probably hasn't been discussed yet today is the brain doesn't sit in isolation. We're also interested in those external factors that influence brain and behavior, such as socioeconomic status, environments, and other biological factors, and also how the brain influences the body and vice versa. So briefly now to dementia, we've made a large investment um, in something called the Dementias Platform UK, which brings together over 30 cohorts within the United Kingdom who have been fantastically well um, um, phenotyped. Their data from all of these individuals is linked to their National Health Service records which gives a huge opportunity in the future to be able to stratify patient groups and think about methodological experimental medicine pro um, programs that could happen in the future. Some of the, um, the, the I guess, power of this um, platform comes from um, recent investments that have been made. One in um, the imaging enhancement to the UK Biobank, which is one of the cohorts that makes up the, the um, Dementia's platform, and you'll hear a lot more about that um, later on this afternoon. Another initiative that we funded recently in partnership with the Department of Health in England is something called the Deep and Frequent Phenotyping Study, which is an excellent um, description of what it's going to do. It's taking a roughly 200 patients with early stage Alzheimer's disease and probably on an almost monthly basis, I believe, taking a variety of um, measurements from imaging and other modalities to assess their progression over a 12-month period, um, which should then help us understand better about the progression of um, dis the disorder over a, a period of time. And then the follow-up studies will link into um, some of the IMI studies that have already been mentioned today. Another initiative which we're very excited about, which is just starting, kind of kicked off with um, ministerial support and then turned into prime ministerial support, although well, the Prime Minister at the time has gone on to do different things now, um, but we still, <laughs> we still have some very high support in government for this. And we are um, working together with two large Alzheimer's um, charities in the UK, Alzheimer's Society and Alzheimer's Research UK, to create a new model of funding for dementia in the UK in the Dementia Research Institute, which is a large investment bringing together people who will look at sort of innovative discovery science and using model systems, um, cell, bullet, cell models, molecular studies, and humans um, to provide a new kind of way of looking at discovery research in this space. It's a slightly distributed model in that there will be a central hub which will be um, announced in the, in the next wee while. There's, there'll be a director um, appointed. The directorship interviews are happening in two days' time, so uh, hopefully within the next while, we'll be able to make some announcements about how this, the leadership for this will, will go ahead. But as I say, there'll be a central hub for the research and linked to a number of um, centres around the UK, all of whom will have incredibly close and um, ongoing collaborations with overseas um, collaborators. So we see this as a real kind of penumbra of research that will be going on in the dementia research space. And as you can see, there's a whole kind of alphabet soup of the various different kinds of initiatives that it will be able to link, link up to, some of which are funded by us, some of which are funded by Department of Health, and others of which are international um, collaborations. And finally, I just wanted to make a few comments around our investments in um, medical informatics. And in a similar vein to our dementia research initiative, we're also um, putting some large investment into medical informatics, which again spans the spectrum of um, the research that the Medical Research Council funds. So it's not just about neuroscience, it's not just about mental health 
on urology. However, there is so much to be learned in this kind of cross-disciplinary space that we don't want to be reinventing wheels here. So I'm sure that there is an awful lot that can be learned from other disciplines um, around the, the world that will help in this um, endeavor. And this new institute will bring together um, informatics investments that we've already made um, around the UK, um, in, um, north of the border in Scotland as well, um, in biomedical informatics and something called the FAR Institute, which is um, set across four institutions already. And I have just a couple of thoughts around um, cooperation that, that we, as from a sort of an MRC perspective, we do collaborate, we do partner a lot, um, and we have stakeholders that include funders from both the UK, EU, and further, um, further afield, um, both from the government and from charity sectors. We also partner with industry, and I think that's another important sector to not forget when they're thinking about partnership and, and um, linking together um, findings. Um, and then we just have to think about what some of the specific aims are, the questions that need to be answered, and the questions that can be answered. Um, and so finally, here's just uh, some coordinates for if you need to contact me at a later date. Okay, thank you. I apologize for not mentioning uh, her name. It's uh, Catherine Haddock, who's speaking on behalf of the MRC in the UK. And our last speaker for the session is uh, representing Israel, Ophir Akunis, the Minister of Science, Technology and Space. Ophir, welcome. Thank you and uh, good morning and thank you for the invitation, of course. Uh, I arrived uh, this morning uh, from uh, Jerusalem and I uh, bring uh, greetings from the State of Israel, the startup nation. We are a country uh, dedicated to cutting edge uh, science and uh, advanced research on the brain and other areas of uh, vital importance to humanity. As uh, Israel's uh, Minister of uh, Science, I am uh, deeply honored to represent Israel at this uh, important meeting. I am uh, delighted to uh, participate in this uh, distinguished international conference of the brain research community. This is a, a, a unique opportunity to transform the progress achieved by uh, our countries into a global effort uh, to benefit our communities uh, and uh, the world. Uh, this vital field of brain research and uh, uh, brain technology is uh, uh, truly inspiring. Uh, it combines the most uh, diverse uh, disciplines to expand our knowledge of the brain. Brain research uh, conducted in Israel and by the world community uh, contributes to the uh, extension and improvement of the quality of human life. Uh, in Israel, uh, brain uh, research is uh, conducted by uh, hundreds of uh, independent research groups across the country, in our nation's uh, uh, research universities, colleges, and uh, hospitals. These uh, groups uh, investigate the wide spectrum of uh, brain. The Israeli researchers are the, um, at the f forefront uh, of their uh, field, uh, ever, st uh, ever striving to advance our uh, understanding of this uh, uh, fascinating and uh, most important organ, the brain. The aim at the discovering improved uh, uh, therapies and cures. Uh, my friends, the Israeli Ministry of uh, Science decided that brain research will be national top priority field of research and that uh, policy includes uh, bilateral uh, joint uh, funding cooperation programs with uh, a lot of countries. Uh, the Israeli government and, and this, uh, its uh, science uh, community are well aware of the great benefits that uh, collaboration between scientists has been uh, has, uh, on the achievement made in research. Um, this uh, uh, perception led to the founding of the Brain Science Knowledge Center at the Hadassah uh, Hebrew University Medical Center in uh, Jerusalem. Uh, this center is a comprehensive resource uh, providing professional guidance and uh, services to the researchers from academia and industry. Um, there's a lot of examples to uh, collaboration uh, with the United Kingdom, with uh, France, with Italy, with uh, Germany, with the United States, of course. Uh, 
our meeting here today at the Rockefeller University is a wonderful opportunity uh, to promote the essential collaboration between uh, different actors in the scientific, academic, and the medical communities, as well as uh, with industry executives, uh, investors, and engineers. I am uh, I'm certain that uh, it will uh, contribute to building strong bonds. I, I call on you, uh, I suggest you, to collaborate and cooperate with Israel in expanding the uh, boundaries of uh, the emerging large-scale international brain project to the benefit of mankind. Thank you for uh, uh, inviting me to, the, to this part of this important conference. Together, I believe that we, together we can bring about uh, great achievements and uh, meaningful breakthroughs uh, for the benefit of humanity. Thank you very much, much and shalom from Israel. In addition to the speakers, I, uh, we wanted to acknowledge the uh, attendance of Peter Dennis, who uh, represents the Department of Energy in the United States, and uh, he will, he's in the audience, and he's a senior scientist at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratories. So now we're moving to Asia. Uh, the first speaker uh, represents the Japanese Agency for Medical Research and Development, Yukata Ishiyama. Welcome. Uh, good morning. I'm Yutaka Hishiyama uh, from Japan Agency for Medical Research and Development. I'm very happy uh, to be here given the opportunity to deliver a presentation on brain science policy and programs in Japan. Be, uh, before talking about the brain uh, science, I would like to introduce shortly a Japan Agency for Medical Research and Development, which is called AMED and established on the 1st of April last year. Uh, it's a very new organization and as a funding agency of medical research and development. Our main role of AMED is to promote, support, and accelerate medical research and development, development uh, through uh, funding from basic research to uh, clinical research. And we received a budget from three ministries. And th this slide shows uh, uh, our budget. And uh, brain science is one of major, uh, nine, nine major fields uh, which uh, uh, AMED stresses to promote. A brain is a scientific frontier that a lot of scientists all over the world have carried out for a long time Brain is a huge organ and consists of 100 billion neurons. We have the approach to brain from such various fields as gene, protein, neurons, circuit, system, and behavior. Thus, integration of research is required. Not only medical doctors, biologists, but also engineers, Information, computational scientists, behavioral scientists, and uh, other relevant fields scientists need to collaborate to address uh, this attractive frontier. Uh, next, I would like to uh, talk about the application aspects of uh, brain science. Brain science could help patients with uh, brain disorders. I should emphasize that brain disorders have large impact on individuals, uh, families, and societies. For example, dementia, including Alzheimer's disease, is a threat to global health as our society is aging. Brain disorders also affect people's quality of life. Major depressive disorder is a major disease burden that has a huge negative impact on society. These serious situations need immediate actions and brain science should play a major role. They are the issues which a lot of countries have been facing. Now, I would like to explain briefly uh, the policy in Japan regarding brain science. Headquarters of Strategy of Health and Medicine, uh, chaired by the Prime Minister, uh, shows the overview of medical research and developing, including brain research. Under the, this plan, uh, the Ministry of Education, Culture, Sports, Science, and Technology submitted a plan and uh, report which describes the importance of promotion of brain science from basic to applied research 
researches comprehensively. And the Ministry of Health, Labor, and Welfare shows a plan of organization of a nationwide registry system uh, for, uh, for persons with dementia, considering possible collaboration with global partners. Relevant ministries cooperate with strong and uh, so, sorry. Uh, uh, relevant ministries cooperate with strong coordination and uh, concrete actions. I would like to introduce to you two major brain science, prog uh, uh, brain science programs, which were created on the basis of the policy I mentioned. The first one is brain mapping by integrated neuro, uh, uh, neuro technologies for disease studies, uh, which, called, uh, which is called Brain Minds. This is a program for primate brain mapping and uh, its application in brain diseases. The second one is an integrated research of neuropsychiatric disease, uh, disorders. This program aims at promoting integration basic and clinical brain research. Uh, Professor Okabe, uh, next speaker, has been managing and leading these two programs uh, as a program director. Japan has three major neuroscience uh, uh, institutes. Uh, they are kind of uh, centers of excellence of brain science. Uh, first one is uh, Riken Brain Science Institute. Next one is National Institute for Physiological Sciences. And uh, the last one is National Center for uh, Neurology and uh, Psychiatry. And finally, I would like to stress the importance of partnership among national projects. Uh, brain science in the first 21st century is a big science. Efforts of individual scientists should be, should be combined to produce coherent data and knowledge. Large-scale national projects should be planned to uh, help building databases and developing new technologies. If several countries and areas, uh, large-scale brain projects already started, as pre presented, uh, as many uh, presenter uh, sh shows today, and their contribution to the progress of uh, brain science is highly expected. Now, it is expected to build partnership between the between these national brain projects, which could contribute to elucidation of brain and the treatment of disease with brain disorders. Thank you very much for your attention. And now are the next speakers, the program director of the Japanese Brain Minds Project, uh, Professor Shigeo Okabe. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, this is Shige Okabe from the University of Tokyo. And I'm very happy to have this five minutes talk after 15 an hour of flight. <laughs> 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 so, but I'm very happy to be here. So, <laughs> so Brain Minds is a program uh, initiated by AMET. And basically, the big goal of this project is to uh, generate a uh, marmoset brain uh, database, which should be useful for the uh, uh, brain scientists outside. And also we want to promote the neural technologies by uh, using this kind of approach. So uh, three years ago, uh, before appearance of this Nature uh, News, we had a very intense discussion about what kind of organization we should take to have this project. And th that was really tough because every scientist have different opinion on how it goes. But uh, eventually, we could boil up the uh, real concept of this project. And we finally end up with having three different teams with different strategies, but they are sharing the same common final goal. And these three teams are first, the Marmoset Brain Mapping team, led by Dr. Okano. And this team just concentrate on getting data and assemble them and integrate them to make a real useful marmoset brain database. And second team is uh, innovative technology led by 
Dr. Miyawaki, and he's a very good scientist working on the making the uh, new genetically encoded fluorescent indicators. So he and other 20 distinguished scientists in Japan make a group and try to push this kind of technology. And third group is led by Dr. Kyoto Kasai, and he's a psychiatrist, and he's going to organize different uh, resources in Japan to make the uh, database for the human brain uh, MRI kind of data. So these three groups are now working very actively. We are having some good achievements which we can uh, introduce later. So why we are using Marmoset? The, uh, the reason is quite simple, because we want to analyze the brain which have similar cortical organization to human. So Marmoset brain is much smaller than human brain, but it basically have uh, same kind of uh, prefrontal organization comparable to the human brain. And also another important point is that we want to do some genetic engineering. So recently uh, developing uh, new techniques for the genome editing should be applied to the Marmoset brain. And Dr. Erika Sasaki and also Dr. Hideyuki Okano are the experts in this field. And their initiative is quite an important piece of our project. And in the next few slides, I want to introduce to you what kind of achievement and what kind of activities we have already done. And the first one is about the team Okano. And he's doing a mapping project of the Marmoset brain. And he introduced ultra-high field MRI system to the Riken BSI, and he already got this kind of very uh, high uh, resolution imaging of the Marmoset brain, which is comparable to the histological sections. And he also used uh, DTI kind of technology to make a macro level connectomes of the Marmoset brains. So this kind of uh, activity is going. And second activities done by Dr. Okano is doing a very high efficient tracer injection kind of strategies. And they already selected appropriate AV vectors and started doing some systematic injection to the marmoset brain. And they have developed the high throughput pipeline for the analysis of this sectioning and imaging and reconstructions. And finally, we want to register this uh, tracer injection data to the MRI-based 3D uh, model to make a kind of final output of this uh, project. And also, this kind of uh, structure and functional mapping should be combined with the behavior analysis. So we are very uh, putting a large effort for making a good new behavior test for the marmoset. And there are mainly six different domains for the behavior analysis. And we are especially interested in this kind of analyzing social domain, including vocalization of marmosets. So this is the first of our uh, activities. And the second one is innovative neurotechnologies led by Dr. Miyawaki. And he's making a good advancement in this field. And recent advancement is about this uh, new probe which can detect the cell to cell contact, and which should be useful for the identification of some previous history of synaptic contact between two neurons in brain. And this team uh, includes many distinguished scientists. And one achievement here is the made by Dr. Haru Kasai. He made an AS probe, which can erase the active probe in the previous learning uh, activities. And by using this AS probe, he could uh, successfully show that by erasing memory synapses, he can actually uh, affect the uh, uh, memory storage uh, acquired by this kind of uh, motor learning. So this is a quite nice achievement, and we want to apply this technique to the marmoset brain. And finally, Dr. Kyoto Kasai is organizing these uh, research activities for the uh, clinical domain. And he is organizing many different uh, uh, university hospitals and acquiring MRI data mainly, and make this kind of uh, human brain database connected with the marmoset brain, and try to understand what kind of uh, brain lesions or circuits are actually defective in the human uh, brain disease patients. So finally, I want to summarize that this brain minds is a 
project with a specific, uh, well-defined uh, goal, and with three different active teams interacting with each other. And I'm hoping that this meeting will promote the interaction between different uh, uh, brain uh, activities in different countries, and I hope uh, brain minds can play an essential role within this international network. Thank you very much. So now we're presenting uh, Republic of Korea, uh, Kyun Jin Kim from the Korea Brain Research Institute. Well, good morning. Uh, it's a great privilege to talk about uh, Korea Brain Initiative in this unique conference. Along with the global trend, we in Korea is moving ahead to set up national basic plan to promote brain science at every 10 years interval. So the Korea Brain Initiative will, be, will start from 2018 for next 10 years as a part of a national basic plan. Here is our aims and strategy. Through our brain initiative, we're trying to strengthen sustainability, sustainable R&D infrastructure, developing cutting edge neural tools, and to enhancing, enhancing global network. Our strategy is rather simple. We put the top priority of uh, brain mapping as a flagship and we're going to use hub and spoke model to enhance competitiveness of brain science by nationwide network. Our initiative has a dual track program. First, we will initiate flagship and many new R&D project, and we're trying to reinforce neuroscience ecosystem in Korea. Let me tell you the first track. In this uh, track, we have uh, four domains. As I told you, brain mapping at the multi-scale is our flagship. Simultaneously, we will gonna to do three different projects. For instance, innovative multidisciplinary project and uh, artificial intelligence related R&D project and personalized medicine for mental and neurological diseases. Track two covers neuroscience ecosystem reinforcement in Korea, consisting four domains. First, fostering human resources. Second, reinforcing sustainable infrastructure. Here we set up brain database station, Korea Human Brain Network, and nationwide core facilities. Third, we uh, reinforcing national and global networking. We're gonna come up with the Asia Brain Consortium. Finally, we try to jump starting future neuro industry. Finally, I am going to touch budget plan. Currently, total budget for ongoing neuroscience research in Korea is about 111 million US dollars, allocating four different subdivisions, neurobiology, cognitive neuroscience, neurological disease, and neuroengineering. Total budget of a Korea Brain Initiative proposed is about 350 million US dollar for 10 years. Annually, it will be 30 to 40 million dollar. 
So next year, our program is in the feasibility studies and uh, technological assessment. If it goes through well, then hopefully we'll start our brain initiative from 2018. Thank you very much. Uh, representing China, Mo Ming Pu, uh, who's the director of the Institute of Neuroscience at the Chinese Academy of Science. A great pleasure to be here. Uh, in a brief amount of time, I want to introduce you to the China Brand Project. Um, next slide. I want. I want to uh, begin with some background. Uh, the, there are two. Um, uh, sorry. Okay. Sorry. Um, there are two main funding agencies in China: the uh, Ministry of Science and Technology, and uh, Natural uh, Science Foundation of China, which is uh, NSF equivalent. And there's no NIH equivalent in, in China. The, the role is mostly uh, uh, provided by the Ministry of Science and Technology. Now, the proposal for a China brand project was submitted on uh, 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 2015, and it was a proposal for 15 years. And this proposal was uh, uh, a compromise between the uh, brain science community and the artificial intelligence community both submitted proposals, and the government decided to fund a project called Brain Science and Brain-Inspired Intelligence Technology. And this was finally approved the, this last March in the state council, and the uh, budget and funding system uh, is not being announced yet. The budget will be equivalent to the uh, U.S. initiative, uh, probably one billion for uh, 10 years. Uh, the uh, how it's going to be run uh, is how much top-down component, how much bottom-up component is the uh, things being debated, and the, the this uh, new uh, funding mechanism is uh, will go along with the Chinese government's initiative in reform of of the uh, science and technology um, ministry uh, system, and that's uh, actively ongo ongoing now. Now, I want to mention the China brain research environment, focused on brain science only, not the intelligence community. The manpower for brain science is actually small. Uh, the homegrown talent overseas returnees now uh, constitute a large portion of the Chinese uh, neuroscientist community, which uh, the latest counts about 6,000. Uh, it's doubling pre uh, every five years, uh, which uh, go along with the funding to basic science. It's also doubling every five years. And the trend for, the, for this increased funding has not slowed down, despite the economic slowdown. Uh, so we are looking for the increasing funding in the uh, brain science. Uh, the current RNA funding accounts for 2.1% of GDP. The goal is uh, to reach 2.5% by 2020. There's a very strong internet, uh, interdisciplinary support in China. Uh, there are ca strong chemistry, physics, computer science, and nanoscience, material science, engineering. Probably more uh, stronger than brain science. And so this is a good base for interdisciplinary interaction. There's an also a very distinct uh, uh, large population of brain disease patients. Uh, it's largest population in every disease uh, in the world. And, and this um, also, uh, together with the very large resources of non-human primates, macaque monkeys, for example. And these uh, two are, seems to be a very important, unique resources for brain science. Finally, there's a tradition of social mobilization at a national scale. Uh, uh, so there is a hope that if the government wants to do something uh, big, uh, with good organization, it's possible that they'll, they'll carry it out uh, uh, successfully. So uh, the, the scheme of the China Brain Project can be summarized as the, uh, the following. It's a one-body, two-win system. You know, the body of this, uh, the, the project is to understand the neural basis of cognitive functions, developing various brain re research platforms in support of this, 
And the two winds are applied winds. Well, on one side, develop effective ap approach in early diagnosis and intervention of brain disease. And the other side, uh, develop brain machine intelligence technology, uh, including brain machine interface and, and uh, artif brain-inspired artificial computing. And this uh, one body, two wind uh, system uh, is the basic framework. Um, let me briefly c cover all these three components. The core components, neural basis of cognitive process is all what we brain scientists are interested in. Uh, it's uh, mapping is everything from mapping to understanding. We need mapping for cell types, mapping of connections, structural connections. We need to map the uh, activity, uh, three mapping uh, projects. And then from there, we can understand uh, the system underlying various cognitive functions, uh, from molecule to circuits to behavior functions. Now, the animal models, now, uh, most people are, use, are working trend in, in the West are uh, using rodents, but uh, there are increasing number of people starting to work on uh, macad monkeys. And there's reason that uh, with uh, good resources and with the decline of uh, primary research in the, uh, in the uh, US and Europe, uh, they appear to be uh, uh, useful to pursue in that direction. So in the, uh, for the brain technology and platforms, so in support of the basic research, there are various uh, platforms which we are all familiar with uh, for single neuron uh, uh, profiling, for circuit tracing, imaging technology, and also various recording and modulation technology. And these are all a standard platform that needs to be uh, established. I mean, there are small platforms in various places, various institutes, and the, this new project would, would help to set up a national scale, uh, sh uh, bigger facility that everybody can share. In the applied component, we are focusing specifically on the early diagnosis and intervention for three major uh, types of brain disorders, developmental, psychiatric, and neurodegenerative disease. We want to understand the, the uh, disease mechanisms as well as uh, early, uh, develop early diagnostic tools. This include uh, genetic molecular imaging tools. And also we think uh, uh, cognitive functional markers uh, is very important. And this, this needs to be uh, strengthened. Now very similar to the uh, so domain specific criterion type program in, uh, that initiated in NIH. Uh, with uh, this require uh, the integration of uh, basic scientists with clinicians and a public health organization to set up large scale screening, early screening from both healthy patient and disease patient for functional tests, uh, easy to use, cheap, and um, uh, can be applied to large number. So finally, pharmacological and, and, and physical mo uh, modulation. We also want to develop disease models, uh, macad mo mo uh, models in particular. Uh, clinical platforms and also apply component, I can go quickly, the brain machine interface uh, uh, and various uh, modulation technologies and brain inspired computing methods and, and, and uh, computing devices. Like this are all things that interest uh, uh, artificial intelligence people, brains by robotics, for example. Finally, a few words on the goal of the non-primary research in China. I think the uh, study of cognitive function using non-human primary as an animal model is um, uh, very important, especially for uh, higher functions that are unique to primates and humans. Generation of uh, genetic modified monkey is now uh, a plausible and very uh, likely uh, given the uh, rapid advance in, in the gene editing technology. So we could uh, uh, hopefully generate non-human primates models, very similar to the Japanese uh, 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 brain mind project. Uh, developing training programs for sustainable research in primate neurobiology. We need to train the next generation of young scientists who know how to work with primates. This is going to be important, probably not, not now, but 10, 20, 30 years from now. And this, uh, there's a tradition for primate biology that needs to be sustained. And this is a training program where we need to also establish a very rigorous ethical practice for monkey research. We need to assimilate the knowledge from the public, how important is the primate research is early, 
and, and also set up good uh, practice. Uh, this is uh, uh, the primary research in China, uh, the uh, future perspective. I'll stop here. Thank you. Uh, now representing the Canadian Brain Initiative, uh, Dr. Anthony Phillips, the Scientific Director, Institute of Neuroscience, Canadian Institute of Health Research. Thank you, uh, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I'm here um, representing the Minister of Health for Canada, Jane Philpott, who sends her best regards. Um, I'm also um, Scientific Director of one of the institutes at CIHR, which is the Canadian Institute for Health Research, the one that deals with neurosciences, mental health, and addiction. Um, and while I haven't included this in my presentation, this organization funds around 20% of all health research in Canada, and the budget is approximately $200 million a year. Um, despite all of these expenditures, we were really impressed by the initiatives undertaken by our American and European colleagues, where they're attempting to and succeeding actually in integrating uh, the neuroscience research in their different communities and so we wanted to emulate that. Um, uh, this slide is meant to portray two things. We do want to bring a new perspective to understanding the brain uh, but it's also meant to convey to you that Canada is cool. <laughs> Thank you. Does that advance it? Yeah, anyway, <laughs> thanks. Um, so the goal of our institute and also the goal of this new initiative that we're trying to coordinate is, first of all, the generation of knowledge. Um, the point's been made many times this morning about how we have to build on a sound basis of understanding of brain function and structure before we can understand and treat uh, the various disorders that arise from brain dysfunction. But nevertheless, we do want to state uh, publicly that uh, when it's appropriate, we really uh, want to emphasize the translation of this knowledge to the improvement of human health. So in order to uh, design a plan, we adopted a bottom-up strategy where I invited all of the leaders of the major neuroscience uh, institutes in Canada, uh, of which there are many, fortunately, and we've met twice so far, once in Montreal and more recently this year in uh, Vancouver. And um, throughout these deliberations, we came up with a number of principles that we, we felt uh, could create uh, a national brain plan for Canada that would also complement what was happening internationally. Um, and here I really want to emphasize this point. It's like a, it's like a, soft, a, a soft diplomacy sort of approach. Canada has been very successful over the last 20 to 25 years in building really effective research collaboration. And it's done it particularly well in the brain research area. And so many speakers uh, this morning have emphasized the need to, to build these teams and, and the management of teams and, and the, um, the, the creation of collaboration is, is absolutely essential. Well, we've been there and we've done that. And we want to make sure that we have this resource uh, at the service of our national brain research activities. Other points that have been touched on, whatever we do, we want to make sure that it's done uh, to the highest ethical standards. And also at CHR and, and as at NIH, we recognize that there are sex and gender issues that need to be factored in when we're understanding something as complex as the brain. The collective wisdom of these two meetings, uh, again, reach the same sort of uh, decisions that many others in this room have, and that is that neuroinformatics, uh, computational modeling, imaging, animal model systems have to be at the core of any national program. And we, too, hope to build a program that, that incorporates these uh, principles. Uh, the other point that the team came up with, uh, and it's illustrated on the next slide, I think I'll just go to that one, uh, and it's the idea that um, the genetics uh, obviously has to be at the, at the core of this. And, and for us, genetics is just as much epigenetics as it is genetics. Uh, we're investing quite heavily in that area. We also see the importance of the new CRISPR-Cas9 uh, gene editing uh, procedures, and we're trying to explore whether we could set up national resources for 
uh, neuro-CRISPR, really, in, in, in Canada. The other <coughs> tremendously uh, important platform has to do with imaging, not just functional brain imaging, but all cellular imaging, all the way up to, obviously, uh, functional brain imaging and network imaging. And uh, our Venn diagram actually puts at its, uh, at its apex, uh, again, other points that have been made about the importance of directing uh, this research to an understanding of psychological functioning, both of uh, cognition and emotion. And don't be afraid to use the C word. I mean, at some point, we're going to have to try to understand the nature of human consciousness. And uh, as you'll see in a moment on another slide, one of our teams in Canada is very focused on this issue. The uh, other point that was underscored at our meetings of, of the neuroscience leader groups is that Canada already possesses not only this capacity for networking, but thanks largely to my colleague Alan Evans at McGill University, Canada already uh, has at its disposal something called C-Brain, which is a Canadian distributed neuroimaging platform. But C-Brain is more than that, or at least the technology behind it is more than that. As this map shows, uh, we're linked uh, across the nation uh, both computing and the data processing is in, in a few areas, but it's shared across the whole, the whole country. And it is built on a number of investments that Canada has made uh, in providing wideband uh, uh, connections between its major universities and research institutes. And Alan and his group have developed uh, a fully functioning system for uh, interfacing this resource to individual labs and it's working beautifully. So while we uh, are delighted to see other initiatives to create similar platforms, we're already there with this system and we're open for business. Um, the other point I would make is that, uh, so now we're trying to figure out how to fund all this. Well, in parallel with our discussions, the federal government had uh, instituted a, a new program called the Canada First Research Excellence Fund. And it came in two tranches. The first phase was in 2015, $300 million. And then on September the 6th, we heard the outcome of the second phase, which was $950 million of funding. So the total is $1.25 billion, uh, designed to position Canada's post-secondary institutions to become global research leaders. And as you can see below here, there were four out of the 13 um, programs that were funded, and these are all the health. Everything was in neuroscience. And this is all done by peer review. Uh, and when you total these numbers up, it comes to um, about $250 million. So we have this, this wonderful new resource, uh, and it's centered, as I said a moment ago, on McGill. There, theirs is called Healthy Brains for Healthy Lives. And then also the University of Western Ontario, uh, which has excellence in uh, neurocognition and imaging is also part of this. But this is the important thing. This is already designed to be interlinked. And so what we're going to do in the next phase is we're going to uh, sit down over the next few months to try to figure out how to expand this network. We have to convince the government that the job is half done and with a little bit more investment, we're going to be able to reach this uh, aspiration of understanding the brain better and then using this information to understand and treat brain illness, which I think is really the goal for everyone in this room. So thank you for your attention, and I can take questions afterwards. Our next speaker represents Australia, Anthony Murphy, the Minister Counselor for Industry, Science and Education of the Australian Embassy in the US. Welcome. So uh, good morning, everyone. And uh, as uh, introduced, I'm the Minister Counselor for Industry, Science and Education. Um, I have the luxury of not having a 15-hour flight to get here uh, as I'm located in uh, DC. Um, so it is a pleasure here to talk to you very briefly about um, what Australia is doing with regard to innovation and science and specifically in areas around uh, brain um, research. 
one of the key things that uh, the, the Australian government is now uh, proceeding down is really embracing the role of science and research, and this was recognised uh, late last year with the release of our national innovation and science agenda. So this was a package of around um, a billion dollars. And it looked at reinforcing the role in science and innovation in driving economic and social prosperity, um, looking at international collaborations and the way that Australia could lift its participation, and looking at fundamentals of the science uh, uh, research landscape by providing um, additional uh, funding in areas such as um, research um, infrastructure. Moving on to the areas of uh, brain research, um, this is an area that Australia is well placed uh, to support. We do have a strong history in uh, this area and its application um, using examples uh, such as uh, the cochlear uh, implant. And um, I'll also talk through some of the other initiatives um, very, very briefly. Um, to reinforce um, this message, uh, there is someone much more qualified than uh, me that will talk to this issue, and that's uh, my colleague, uh, Professor Linda White, who will talk about some of the work the, Academy, uh, the Australian Academy of Sciences is uh, currently um, considering. So moving on to uh, some of the funding um, activities that are underway within uh, Australia. Um, the first one that comes to mind is with the National Health and Medical Research uh, Centre, in a way akin to the NIH uh, here, in that it's a medical research funding agency. It doesn't actually undertake uh, research itself. Uh, there is one thing that the NHMRC does undertake uh, with the US, and that is in relation to uh, the brain initiative that was announced by um, President Obama a couple of years ago. And so the NHMRC does provide uh, funding to the Australian component of um, collaborative applications with our US colleagues in uh, areas such as the Foundation of Human Brain Imaging, Bridging Scales and Modalities. The aim of this funding opportunity is to solicit applications around non-invasive human brain imaging and neuroscience uh, recording techniques and to understand the meaning of the data that is collected. Um, Australia is contributing around 1.5 million um, to those um, that uh, initiative. And more recently, um, those that monitor um, the Australian um, uh, science and research funding landscape uh, may have seen that the NHMRC has said it's currently considering, um, that doesn't mean it's confirmed, but it is um, letting people know that it's uh, considering supporting Australian research for the um, two brain initiatives um, that uh, have opportunities in 2017, and they relate to non-invasive functional human brain imaging and recording and non-invasive neuromodulation, new tools and techniques for um, precision measurements. I'm pretty impressed. I can say a lot of those really big um, words. Anyway, there will be uh, further information available through the NHMRC in um, October 2016. Um, with the remaining a lot of time, I thought I'd just take this opportunity to talk about some of the other opportunities really focused on international collaboration um, uh, within um, Australia. Uh, one of the recent ones that we have, it's called a, a Global Innovation Linkages Fund, and it's really looking to support Australian business and researchers to engage with global partners in areas of priority um, uh, research, and one of those is in the uh, field of medical technologies and pharmaceuticals. Um, I know I've seen some of the uh, NSF funding figures this morning and um, the NIH's funding figures and they uh, sort of dwarf some of the funding that's available through the Australian government. That being said, um, you know, we are funding projects of around $1 million over four years to really drive some of these collaboration in areas such as pharmaceuticals and medical technologies. And that application is actually open at the moment and it closes on the 20th of October 2016. Another thing that we're trying to do too, and it touches on some of the discussion today about you know, um, getting some of this great research out um, to market, is that we've developed things um, called industry growth centres. Um, and they're very much about working with industry to allow the industry to work out where it wants to go in 10 years' time. And some of the research that's undertaken here sort of really firmly fits in that, um, that broader um, um, future vision. So we have a framework in place that's looking to work with both research and industry within Australia to work out where we can uh, be competitive um, uh, 10 years down the track. 
And finally, I want to touch on to uh, other funding um, programs that the, the Australian Government has put in place. One is called the Medical Research Futures Fund. So this was essentially a $20 billion um, endowment that was uh, put aside. And um, the returns on that uh, funding is uh, going forward towards medical uh, research. That is expected to provide funding of about a billion dollars um, per year. It, in the next four years, it'll build to about 800 million. But again, it's another funding opportunity that is coming online. Um, it is overseen by a what we call the Australian Medical uh, Research Advisory um, Board, and it is looking um, at ways in which that fund can be used. Um, it has just finished um, a series of uh, consultation and is preparing a report on priorities um, to be considered by the Australian Government. And finally, before the cricket sounds, um, I've heard it a couple of times today, um, it's the Biomedical Translation Fund. And this fund un is really around how do we translate some of the research that um, is being undertaken. And it's $250 million really focused on um, the, the biomedical translation component of medical um, research. I will stop there because I haven't heard the cricket and I'm more than happy to talk about any of those programs that I've discussed through any of the breaks. Thank you for your time. So the person probably flew the longest is our next uh, speaker, Linda Richard, uh, Professor, uh, Deputy Director of Queensland Brain Institute from uh, Queensland, Australia. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, to Corey and Rafa for organising such a fantastic um, conference. It's a really exciting time to be a neuroscientist anywhere in the world, I think. and. Um, uh, Australia is no different. We have um, organised ourselves uh, to create a vision for um, Australian neuroscience that we hope will contribute to the, the global initiatives. This initiative is being led through the Australian Academy of Science and has uh, major supporters from the Australasian Neuroscience Society and the Australian Psychological Society, along with um, a large number of uh, other organisations. So we're um, in the startup phase of our um, Australian Brain Project Alliance. And so we started meeting earlier this year to look at what are the goals uh, that we want to achieve and how can we organise our sector to contribute to um, the global initiatives. And so we have done, I think, one of the, the hardest jobs which is actually to get everybody on board behind this program uh, across our nation. And so we have, um, we have a very cohesive group uh, that are, um, are striving for these, um, these goals. So we've um, started developing our science plan. And as you've just heard, our Australian government is very keen that we um, engage with industry. And so part of our plan is uh, uh, involves engaging directly with industry partners and also um, to establish some uh, philanthropic relationships as well, which would really help us get this program off the ground. We plan to launch our, our Brain Alliance uh, next April. So um, I was asked to um, just go over some of uh, the strengths and what perhaps our uh, Australian Brain Initiative could bring to the, to the global um, Brain project. And as you may know, the basic scientists would know that uh, Australia has a very long history in uh, neurophysiology, um, beginning really with our Nobel Prize um, from Sir John Eccles. But we also have a very um, strong and long history in uh, neural engineering. And I'd say that this is a, a great strength in Australia that might not be as evident to uh, some of the basic scientists. Uh, one of our um, major successes has been the cochlear implant. This is the one, one of the most successful neurotechnologies worldwide. Um, Axon Instruments, who um, make a lot of the recording devices for electrophysiology. And we have two, um, a bionic eye program, but also a bionic vision program, looking at st directly stimulating the visual cortex as opposed to the retina. And we have a number of companies involved in stimulation for control of pain, and these are already in clinical trials. 
Another thing that we have uh, that we can offer are very well characterized cohorts of different groups. So we have a very active and uh, prominent group working in epilepsy that's led by Sam Berkovich and Ingrid Schaeffer. This is mostly around uh, the genetics of epilepsy. But we have a number of other patient cohorts or even um, uh, subject cohorts that may be of interest. We've got an extensive twin registry and uh, we have a number of um, longitudinal cohorts uh, that have been running for 20 plus years with very, very well characterised data and I can um, give you more details about those later if you're interested. As I said, um, we also have uh, major strengths in bioengineering. I'm just going to run through some of the national programs that we have currently going. And uh, these are ones, of course, that we'd like to build on. So we have a, a Bionics Institute. This is really uh, driving neural prostheses uh, across um, these different areas. We also have a uh, cooperative research center for mental health which is um, driving in the area of biomarkers for psychiatric disorders. We have a Science of Learning Research Centre. So these are, not just lo these are not located in one area in Australia. These are um, uh, collaborative projects that grow across many, um, many different laboratories, up to 10 to 20 laboratories across Australia. The Science of Learning Research Centre is really aimed at education. So this is taking what we understand about how the brain learns and applying that to the classroom. And indeed, we have um, laboratory classrooms that we can bring both teachers and children in to um, conduct experiments and look at how uh, optimal learning can occur. We also have the Centre for Integrative Brain Function. This also includes uh, 20 laboratories across Australia, and they're really focused on intention, prediction, and decision making. And I should say that one of the main drivers for this is our fantastic national infrastructure in terms of brain imaging. So in addition to these, um, Australians do con contribute to a large number of different international consortiums, and I'm not going to list them all here. But we are um, part of the Enigma Consortium and have been major uh, drivers in that. So that's in neuroimaging and genetics. Also in the Psychiatric Genomics Consortium, we've been major drivers in the statistical analysis of um, genomic data. And um, actually, I, I saw uh, George Paxanos was mentioned before in the Japanese initiative. Um, Paxanos and Watson, of course, are Australians, and we have a long history in terms of um, anatomical atlases. Um, a number of groups are now setting up to do marmoset imaging in Australia as well, in particular at Monash University. So um, our brain initiative, what is our plan? We have identified four grand challenges that we'd like to address. Uh, promoting this better health, uh, creating better neural interfaces, so this is in terms of bioengineering, We'd like to really focus on learning, how we learn across the lifespan. And that really runs everything from cellular, uh, molecular work all the way up to um, cognitive neuroscience. And then in, um, delivering new insights for brain-inspired computing. We also have an extensive group of computational neuroscientists in Australia that are driving this. So these are the groups that are involved, and as I said, the main initiative is being run out of the Australian Academy of Science. So thank you very much. So um, this marks the end of the scheduled speakers who are talking about um, the international brain projects and the government projects. I would just like to recognize two people who are in the audience now. One is uh, Dr. Carlos Pena from the Food and Drug Administration of the United States, who really is very, um, is here in part because he's really confident that these initiatives are going to lead to a wave of new drug development um, that will be of interest to the FDA, and the FDA is interested in partnering with people to develop those going forward. And then the second person is um, Dr. Henry Sun from Taiwan who um, is just here to, will just mention and can discuss with people that he is 
himself a, um, rep, um, wants to, people to know that Taiwan is also starting a brain initiative. And um, this is one of several additional countries who we've learned about in the course of planning this meeting. I think having people step and identify themselves has been one of the most important things that we've accomplished at this meeting. If we could, if we could step down, just a couple of other comments on other organizations and countries that have um, mentioned the brain initiatives, have mentioned interest in the brain initiatives. We have here today with us Ahmed Ektari from Iran, um, who's reflecting the role of brain initiatives now in other countries in the Middle East. And the World Health Organization is really very interested in brains and health. And we have with us um, Pedro Valdez Sosa from Cuba, the Cuban Neuroscience Center, Valeria de la Maggiore from the University of Buenos Aires. And, um, and um, at that point, I will turn it over to the next part of our session, the private partners who are working with the governments. And our first speaker today is Hongkui Zeng from the Allen Institute for Brain Sciences. First of all, I also want to say thanks to uh, Corey and Rafa for organizing this wonderful meeting, to bring all of us together from all over the world to talk about brain. Um, I'll give you a brief overview of the brain project at the Allen Institute for Brain Science. Uh, since the funding of the institute in 2003 by our um, founder and a philanthropist, Paul Allen, um, the institute has been developing a research platform and generating large-scale data set to serve the community um, under the principles of big science, open science, and team science. So in this regard, the LIGO talk uh, we heard this morning actually resonates with me a, a lot. Um, it's the, the kind of um, program management, uh, organization, teamwork um, that's really um, uh, making us unique or hope uh, that we hope that um, that will give us a unique identity uh, as a young organization uh, in the neuroscience field. And um, if I had time, I would be happy to give my personal testament <laughs> uh, in terms of how uh, this principles, the open science and the big science, uh, team science principles are rigorously enforced at the Institute by our senior leaders, uh, Alan Jones and Christoph Koch. Um, so, um, in our now new 10-year plan, which runs from 2012 to 2021, uh, in addition to continue to provide resources to the community, we also begin to uh, try to ask some, um, to challenge ourselves to uh, systematically address some questions, particular questions about how a brain circuit works. And um, through uh, intensive discussion, Within the Institute, we have come up with this um, 3C principles or 3C um, framework to guide our work, uh, component, computation, and cognition. The idea behind this is that instead of using a purely top-down approach, like say picking a behavior and use that to guide um, you know, exactly what we're gonna do, or a ground-up approach, like let's understand uh, the basic composition of the, of the brain first and then move gradually up, we thought that it might be useful to take a multi-tiered, multi-level approach simultaneously from all different levels, from the components level, computational, and cognitive and behavior level to, uh, uh, um, to try to address the problem. And the problem is to pick a particular circuit and trying to see how it processes the information. So under this kind of a principle, we developed, uh, we have been developing a whole uh, suite, a whole ladder of uh, technology platforms uh, and pipelines um, uh, to uh, understand uh, two circuits that we picked. One is uh, in the mouse, the uh, visual cortical circuit, and the other is in the human, also a cortical circuit uh, it, it, with whatever you know, tissue we can obtain from um, post-mortem uh, human brains or surgically resected uh, human tissues. So um, currently we have been developing a set of technology platforms spanning from the systematic characterization of cell types um, to the systematic calculation of connectivity among the cell types and the individual cells uh, in both the local circuit and its embedded global circuit 
to uh, developing behavior paradigms and uh, large-scale in vivo imaging approaches um, to monitor neuronal activities under that behavior paradigm, to finally uh, building uh, computational models um, and developing series uh, trying to integrate all the data generated from these different uh, types of uh, experimental approaches and, and trying to make sense of what is going on in that particular circuit. So uh, with all these things, uh, different um, approaches together, um, they, they culminate into two major um, projects or products, uh, two major uh, flagship projects that we are developing right now. And the first one um, is the cell types database. Uh, so in this um, cohesive uh, cell types database, we use a multi-tiered approaches of, um, at a single cell level. This includes transcriptomic profiling of individual cells isolated uh, from the circuit, uh, as well as isolated maybe after uh, electrical recordings uh, to, to identify the molecular features of the types, and physiological, morphological, and connectional approaches. And the connectional approaches at both structural and functional levels um, with this kind of um, multi-tier data set, we hope to generate data-driven classification of the cell types with our circuit and continue the development of genetic tools to label those cell types to allow functional manipulation and build uh, the database with all the data uh, presented together. The second platform is the um, Brain Observatory um, platform or product. Here, we again integrated different levels of imaging approaches uh, from uh, wide field uh, mesoscale um, imaging to higher resolution cellular level imaging at two four, using two photon microscopy uh, to um, electrical recordings, large scale electrical recordings using um, uh, different silicon probes uh, to generate uh, data sets. Uh, for the, in this particular case, the mouse uh, cortical circuits, um, and at the same time, developing computational uh, models at both single neuron and um, a network level to uh, interpret the data and uh, trying to understand data. And finally, I want to say that um, the, what, what we're doing here on a particular circuit can be really expanded into the study of other circuits, and we continue to follow our uh, principle of providing resources to the community, and that resources span from gene expression to cell type characterization to brain activity, uh, connectivity mapping, and uh, um, activity mapping, and also taking a, um, a leading role in setting standards uh, for the field. The standards are shown here uh, with um, uh, example projects like Neural Data Without Borders, with generating um, a multiplicity of transgenic tools, and with uh, setting up uh, a, a anatomical framework uh, to guide uh, all the experimental work in this, under this precise anatomical brain uh, circuit context. So with that, thanks for your attention. Our next presenter will be Jerry Fischbach from the Simons Foundation. Thanks, Corey. I want to congratulate everyone for making it here in this wet, challenged, threatened city, but a gritty city which in many ways is the center of uh, science and technology. So I want to speak to you about the Simons Foundation, which was established about 20 years ago by Jim and Marilyn Simons, and which in recent years has grown very rapidly. The purpose from the beginning was to fund basic research, discovery-oriented research, and math and physical sciences, life sciences, the entire spectrum of autism disorders, and most recently in education and outreach. We now distribute about $400 million a year, mostly to individual science applications, judged by review committees and advisory boards. But in a few years ago, three years ago, 
a new direction was defined to fund collaborations, small collaborations, in addition to funding individual projects. And here the goal was to identify significant questions which had a very strong chance of success in answering them over the course of eight to 10 years. Questions that would attract the very best investigators in their field. And there are now about six of them, and you can read about them on our website on the origin of life, on astrophysics, on ocean demography, and microbiome. But I want to talk to you about the science, the Simons collaboration on the global brain, which has evolved over time. The purpose of this is to understand neural codes in populations of neurons studied at the level of single cells to ensure the proper temporal and spatial resolution of uh, fleeting thoughts in the brain, plans, decisions, uh, spatial navigation, and a number of others. The, um, the, this has been remarkably successful in a very short period of time. It involves uh, now 47 different grants, about 98 investigators, and more than 100 postdoctoral fellows. Each one of these grants is a collaboration between a theorist and an experimentalist. And there's a great deal of novel new theory that has to be learned here to, in order to, to reduce the dimensionalities of recording from tens to thousands of neurons and to understand the dynamics of how these code, codes change during the progress of a thought. The, um, there's no question that understanding the normal brain will benefit from understanding the disordered brain. But right now, we make no distinction and focus on the fundamental questions. One, one emphasis is to use the most modern technologies, not to develop them. We will benefit from what we just heard from the Allen Foundation and many others, but how you record both optically and electrically from populations of cells. But we want to leapfrog over the connectomics to understand the programs and the codes in the brain. As I said, to understand decisions before there's overt action, to understand environmental cues, memory recall, working memory, and social cognition. There is definitely a need for collaboration here and for data sharing. We are now in the process of promoting even greater small scale collaborations and are beginning to think about larger, perhaps global collaborations in cohort with other foundations and with the government. This will take a huge effort to understand things like data sharing, how you preserve individual creativity, and the ethics of this type of research in terms of mind control and brain science. But it's an exciting time, and I look forward to hearing all the projects going on at this meeting. Thanks. Our next speaker is Carl Svoboda, representing the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Thank you, Corey. I'm here really to represent the Genia Research Campus. Uh, Genia is a research center fully funded by the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. We're close to Washington, D.C. And um, we opened our door about 10 years ago, um, and there are right now about 800 scientists, scientific staff, and other staff housed in a really beautiful uh, research uh, building. Uh, close to your heart are uh, 
research focus is uh, to identify the general principles that govern how information is processed in neural circuits and to develop supporting imaging and computational technologies. So scientists at Janelia both pursue basic uh, brain research, mainly in genetic uh, model organisms such as flies and mice, but uh, there are also a lot of technology efforts ongoing. We work on engineering proteins for measuring neural activity, creating new transgenic animals for research, assembling neuroanatomical atlases, designing new microscopes, and inventing really the algorithms that allow us to analyze neurophysiological and behavioral data. So research at Janelia really uh, proceeds on multiple tracks. Uh, central to our endeavor is really our 45 research groups uh, headed by principal investigators and my uh, colleague Kristen Branson, who will uh, present her wonderful work to you this afternoon, and I are both principal investigators at Janelia. Uh, these uh, research group uh, operate similarly to uh, university research labs with some important distinctions. These are typically small research groups on the order of five people or so. Uh, we, uh, most of us practice open science. We make the fruits of our research uh, openly available relatively quickly and as openly as possible. And about a quarter of the research groups themselves work in the space of neurotechnology. So the primary output of their research is tools for research uh, for others. And finally, we're strongly encouraged to collaborate within Genelia and outside of Genelia. Now, in uh, addition to this uh, more traditional mode of doing science, Genelia has project teams, and these are teams that are focused on developing particular resources or technologies. So they're typically led by multiple investigators and can be larger, up to about 20 uh, research staff. And by the way, feel free to browse our websites to learn more the detail. More, more more about the details. And these project teams have milestones and deliverables, not unlike some of the efforts ongoing at the Allen Brain Institute. At the Allen Brain Institute, for deliverables, they use the more Wellian term, smart goals. We use uh, deliverables. So uh, uh, the scientific output from uh, project teams is distributed to the scientific community, typically long uh, before, uh, before publication. So current project teams include reconstructing the entire fly brain at ele electron microscopic resolution, that is the connectome of the entire fly brain, atlas of cell types imaged across the entire uh, brain, and so on and so forth. So I'd like to tell you a little bit in a little bit more detail about one of these project teams, the Gini project at Genelia, which engineers fluorescent proteins for tracking neuronal function. And our pro, uh, approach is based on protein engineering coupled with high throughput uh, screening. The preliminary output of the project is reagents that are distributed through public repositories like ADGI in the UPenn Vector Core, JAX, and so on and so forth. And the Gini project is essentially like, a, you can think of it like a biotech company where the product is uh, knowledge and reagents that are given away for free. So the business model of the Gini project is basically to lose about one and a half million dollars a year. <laughs> so the impact of this project uh, and, and many, uh, and some other uh, similar technology projects, for example, from the Allen Brain Institute have been, has been sus substantial. For example, we've made the most widely used fluorescent protein indicators for neural function. This year alone, about 250 research papers are based on Gini sensors, and many of these publications really come from other laboratories. Uh, outside of um, Genelia, so it's really a community effort. So the, co the development of better sensors, of course, interacts, uh, protein sensors interacts with other technology development. There's synergy uh, in this area. So for example, there, it has created opportunities for new microscopy methods. Uh, for example, the miniaturized microscopes produced by Inscopics would be uh, not very useful uh, without the high signal-to-noise ratio provided by the uh, Gini GCAMP sensors. Uh, similarly, motivated by the high uh, signal levels of the GCAMP sensors, we have made two photon microscopes that break a fundamental constraint between high-resolution imaging at the level of individual neurons and at the level of entire brain region. This is an uh, example here, this movie of such a microscope that allows you to now 
image individual neurons, but now at the level of multiple brain regions over fields of view that are uh, about 100-fold larger than previous microscopes, all enabled by these protein component, uh, by these new protein sensors. So as you've heard many times, the brain might be the most, uh, the preeminent intellectual challenge of facing contemporary science. We, uh, at Genelia, recognize the need of large-scale coordinated projects to develop key technologies and uh, knowledge, and we're eager to coordinate, uh, collaborate with many of you, of you to create synergies, uh, to avoid duplication, and uh, to really accelerate progress towards a common uh, goal. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Our next speaker is Mi Young Chun from the Kavli Foundation. Thank you very much. Uh, I wanted to actually first thank both Rafa Yuste and uh, Corey Bargman for your hard work to organize this meeting. And I hope you didn't take a few minutes, seconds away from my five minutes on that one. <laughs> Okay, so the science programs at the Cavalry Foundations have um, two different modes of action. One is uh, for us to support research through Cavalry Institute, uh, and we support four disparate fields, uh, theoretical physics, astrophysics, nanoscience, and neuroscience. Our intimate understanding of physical sciences in our minds is what we bring uh, the biggest strength to the neuroscience community. Uh, the rest of the programs are all things gathering scientists and us listening. Uh, we look for uh, scientists' conversation uh, and looking for the frontiers of science or, more importantly, a uh, gap in the field. None of these programs work in a silo and they work together. And uh, I think that earlier uh, our president and CEO mentioned about our role in developing the brain initiative. So perhaps I don't repeat what he said, but uh, I think that we're still trying to listen in and try to catalyze activities uh, at this point to make sure that the brain initiative will have a strong uh, sustainability down the road. So for example, many scientists reached out to us with the need for coalescing the voice for the brain initiative. So starting last summer, July, we put together uh, several meetings. And in this case, we get gathered all the brain initiative funders, including NIH, NSF, DARPA, IARPA, FDA. Um, and also important is all of the private uh, funders. Simon's Foundation played very important role in leadership here, as well as HHMI, Allen Institute, and others. And those discussions led to the uh, the birth of the Brain Initiative Alliance that Walter Korshet from NIH mentioned earlier. This uh, alliance uh, has now designed a website called braininitiative.org. Uh, this is a uh, website where you can go and learn all about Brain Initiative, but more importantly, many of scientists who are here, this will be the one-stop shop for you to understand all of the Brain Initiative funding. So I think that this is a really good service uh, to the scientific community. Uh, I think that earlier, a variety of different uh, federal funding agencies at the United States have shown their own each individual's budget. But here's the uh, accumulation of those budgets uh, from starting from 2014 and up to requested budget for 2017. Uh, not only the budget is increasing, but also it's very strong. And as you can see by 27 budget, uh, there are now multiple federal funding agencies in the states who are involved in uh, supporting brain initiative. And all, all together, already in four years, uh, federal funding for about billion dollars would have spent uh, in, in the states. We should remind ourselves that Brain Initiative here uh, is in combination of private funding as well as, uh, as federal. And I think the private funding shown here in yellow uh, shows how uh, healthy our budget is as well. Uh, I want to spend a couple minutes just talking about uh, three ways the Cavalry Foundation is supporting the Brain Initiative uh, projects. Uh, 
Uh, first is our support for the research through Kavli Institutes. There are 20 Kavli Institutes around the world. Of those, seven of them are neuroscience institutes. And last year, we announced uh, that uh, there will be more than $100 million new money that will coming into Brain Initiative uh, related projects coming from our uh, partner universities along with the foundation. So we're very proud of this commitment. In addition, we also look for pilot projects. Uh, we just actually provided a seed grant to Mark Schnitzer and Carl Dysroth, who will collaborate with uh, scientists and engineers at the Stanford Linear uh, Accelerator Lab. It's a Department of uh, Energy National Lab to design revolutionary CMOS cameras. And I think earlier we heard from uh, LIGO scientists that you know having new tool development that makes 10 times better capability made them to actually detect gravitational wave. And we hope that these kinds of uh, sophisticated um, technical expertise from Department of Energy uh, National Lab could come into neuroscience and have us uh, really enjoy the new adventure in neuros uh, neuroscience community. Uh, because now I'm running out of time, I'll just mention a couple other projects that we're working on for Kavli Coffee Hour, which will really encourage scientists to generate ideas, and most importantly in our minds, uh, sharing data in this large endeavor is going to be one of the most important elements and the success of uh, these initiatives. So then uh, we hope that uh, someday that a lot of wonderful and great minds uh, around the world in Nairobi and Jakarta and Bogota will have an equal opportunity to discover new insights about the brain. Thanks. So our next speaker from the uh, Max Planck Institute in Germany, representing also the Wellcome Trust in London, is Tobias Bonhoeffer. Thanks very much, uh, Corey. Thanks very much, Rafa, for organizing this and for also bringing me here. So as Corey said, I'm uh, representing two organizations, uh, the Max Planck Society uh, in Germany and the Wellcome Trust in London in England. Uh, for Max Planck, uh, less official because I'm uh, just, so to speak, one of the give and take 25 uh, Max Planck directors uh, who is interested in neuroscience research. And um, for the welcome, more officially, because I'm on the board of governors, I'm one of the six science governors of this uh, biomedical charity, by the way, uh, the second largest biomedical charity in the world after the Gates Foundation. So um, both um, organizations are, are very interested and heavily inter invested in brain research. None of them have a formal, consolidated, coordinated uh, brain project as we've heard about in, uh, for some of the previous speakers, NIH for instance, but also others, other countries, other organizations. So in, in that sense, there's uh, not much that I can report on of uh, such a, a, a formal project, but I thought it would uh, anyway uh, be uh, worthwhile to just quickly report on the philosophy which of the two organizations which you'll see is uh, quite different and, and uh, how those organizations could get involved in brain projects or how you could get involved with them. So um, as I said, uh, the organizations are fundamentally different. Uh, the Max Planck Society really lives and thrives uh, of the independence of the directors and the directors really want to be the ones who decide uh, what they want to do. So it'll be quite difficult, I think, to convince the Max Planck leadership of a top-down approach that they tell all their directors, this is what you have to do now. You have to solve this problem or that problem in the sense that uh, David Shoemaker uh, said it earlier about the LIGO uh, project. So, so that's how the Max Planck Society functions. That's, of course, not to say that the single directors wouldn't be very interested in contributing to the brain project, but it would have to be grassroots. One would have to talk to the directors rather than to the leadership. Um, that's, um, that's at least uh, my assessment of, of how it works. The Wellcome Trust, of course, also uh, funds uh, independent research, has a very big program on, uh, on neuroscience, and also there the researchers put in grants and decide in a way themselves uh, what they want to do. But uh, just recently, uh, the Wellcome, and that's the Board of Governors, of which I'm part, together with the Executive Board, has decided that there are actually a couple of areas in science where a different approach, a little bit like uh, David described it earlier, uh, 
uh, is uh, more useful. And what we um, what we created is something that's called uh, uh, strategic priorities. And we have so far two strategic priorities, which are uh, vaccine development and drug-resistant infections, where we think uh, it may be beneficial if we actually, from the welcome top down, have a bigger thing where perhaps even one or two or even more scientists sit at the welcome and really coordinate what needs to be done here and there and there. And that, I think, is uh, something which is um, quite uh, similar to some of the things that we've heard about brain projects that we've certainly uh, heard about why LIGO was uh, so successful. So in that sense, um, that may be an interesting opportunity. For neuroscience, uh, such um, a strategic priority at Wellcome does not exist yet, which does, of course, not at all mean that it can't, uh, cannot exist. We're actually talking to a couple of groups who are interested in taking that route, and um, there may be outcomes uh, even in the not too distant future, but I think that's an interesting opportunity because it's a different way of doing science, and uh, that's also not to say that all of neuroscience should be done like that, but some aspects also in neuroscience, I think, uh, lend themselves to this more strategic approach where you actually have kind of a, a project manager or many project managers who, who manage the whole thing and say uh, which uh, things have to, um, uh, have to be uh, solved or addressed. In terms of uh, the format for the Wellcome Trust, everything goes basically, I mean, we're a private charity, so uh, basically the Board of Governors has to be uh, convinced that it's an interesting and worthwhile project and then it'll be considered and, and possibly funded. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Anna Marie Engel from the Lundbeck Foundation. First of all, I'd like to say a warm thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here and a great, great inspiration. I represent a private foundation in Denmark and our, our vision at the foundation is to create better lives through new knowledge. I'll tell you a little bit about who we are and, and a bit more about how we work with supporting research uh, and with the brain in focus. We are a private corporate foundation, and that means that we have two equally important goals in life by our statutes. One is to be a good owner of our subsidiaries, and the other is to do, have charitable activities. And at Lundbeck Funden, we work with that almost solely by granting support to biomedical research. And in our doing that, we have the brain in focus. So this is, this is a bit about who we are. I'd like to share with you a bit about what we do. We focus on supporting researchers. We focus on the younger researchers. We focus, of course, on the, on the best ones. Every funder says that they do that and everybody wants to do that. But we particularly focus on internationalizing Danish research, and in this case, Danish neural research and brain research. And we do that, that for multiple reasons, but one is that we are a very small country, and that means that our excellent research environments are relatively small, and yet they are doing very well internationally, and they do very well internationally because they seek international collab collaboration, and with our support to research, we want to stand behind that. So we focus on researchers in two ways. We support the best projects, and the ex example given on the slide here is for young researchers, who are ready to establish their own research group at a Danish institution. I should say that all the research that we can support must have some sort of anchorage to Denmark. That's in our statutes. And the other way you can help support research is to acknowledge those who've done an excellent job in research. And we do that particularly by granting the Brain Prize, which is a, a large European-based neuro research prize given out once a year, and I'll get back to that. First, I'd like to share with you two examples of how we work with international brain projects. And one is that we have this year, with pride, uh, joined forces with the NIH Brain Projects in the way that we are now collaborating with them. We are offering Danish researchers a chance to, co to uh, take part in brain initiative projects in two different ways. One is that if they decide together with the ones who have a grant from the brain initiative already, 
that they should join forces, they can, that they can bring something to this project that it would otherwise not have. They can seek additional funding from our foundation to join uh, a project that's already running. The other is if they are already collaborating with pr uh, people at other research groups who'd like to, to uh, apply for support from the BRAIN initiative, they can do so together and they can tell us and then we will decide whether we will fund the Danish part of this. So this is the matching funding part. The other thing that I'd like to talk to you about is this. This is a project that exists already. It's called ISAC, Integrative Psychiatric Research. We've been funding that for almost six years now, and they have a chance of another three-year funding, provided they do good, and they've done excellent so, so far, so we have no reason to believe that they won't in the next period of time as well. This is first five, now six leading Danish researchers from different disciplines who've come together to share their knowledge and, and uh, enter into a symbiotic uh, collaboration on understanding what's behind the, some of the major psychiatric uh, diagnoses and, and mental illnesses that we have. So they're trying to attack this problem from different angles, bringing together their different uh, expertises. And, and this is working extremely well. So they, you can collaborate nationally and internationally. And these people are a great example of both because with the network that they brought with them into this collaboration funded by Lundvig Fund, they actually brought in the Broad Institute and, and, and a very great network there, there, both scientifically, but also being able to attract funding from, from the US to collaborate particularly on the research um, databases and great epidemiological ba bases we have in Denmark. So now for the Brain Prize. It's been awarded six times now. We started in 2011. It's a personal prize of one million euros. It's granted to researcher, one researcher or a group of researchers who have done something specific for <laughs> increasing our understanding of the brain with a rootage in, in Europe. And as you can see, very high-level people have received the prize already. And, and, and in addition to the prize, there is an outreach, outreach program in, in Denmark and internationally because we want to build on the collaboration that's already taking place once people reach these goals. So finally, I'll say that we believe very strongly at Lundbeck Fund in public-private partnerships and international collaboration in order to reach even higher standards within international brain research. So we look forward to being part of this as well. Thank you. Our next speaker is Inez Jabalpurwala from the Brain Canada Foundation. Nearly 20 years ago, a group of business and science leaders came together with a bold vision to transform brain research in Canada by increasing the scale of funding and changing the way that we do research. That vision was to harness the collaborative energy of Canadian research and enable our world-class scientists to come together in new ways across disciplines and institutions and to look at the brain as one system with commonalities across the range of disorders. Our view was that we needed to understand the brain in both health and in illness. Funding would come from donors and partners, but ideas would come from the bottom up, from the science community. Over a 10-year period, Brain Canada, which was then known as Neuroscience Canada, established a track record of breakthroughs, funding multidisciplinary teams pursuing paradigm-changing ideas and partnering with others in the space who shared our commitment to brain research. And in 2010, we approached the Government of Canada to expand this vision to create a dedicated fund for brain research in Canada. And in 2011, recognizing the need to increase investment in brain research, as well as the capacity of Canada's world-class researchers and clinicians, the Government of Canada established a public-private partnership with Brain Canada, through which government is matching on a one-to-one -one basis all funds raised by Brain Canada and its partners up to $100 million over six years. This partnership 
was formed with great optimism called the Canada Brain Research Fund. And our goal was to expand the philanthropic space for supporting brain research and invest these funds efficiently and to achieve maximum impact. An arm's length from government would enable us to be nimble and flexible and to be able to harness emerging opportunities as well as, of course, to raise funds from the private sector. The Canada Brain Research Fund was officially launched in 2012, and by the fall of 2015, we had fully reached our goal of $100 million, 18 months ahead of schedule. This rapid progress was a result of a growing list of private donors, foundations, and corporations, and partners, now numbering 91, which include research institutes, provincial agencies, and voluntary health organizations, which brought to us the voices of the patients, families, and caregivers. All of the priority areas for investment were established by donors and partners working with Brain Canada and not top down by the government. And so what emerged for funding was an intersection of donor and partner interests and our best scientists providing their best ideas. And in addition to this, we operate with a very lean model so we can say that of that first $200 million tranche, only approximately 5% is going to cover operations including running our programs. Now, from 2012 to this month, we have already awarded $176.2 million to, in new funding to support 166 projects across the country, which involve more than 750 researchers at 70 institutions. We now have three types of grants. Uh, our team grants, which remain our signature grants, but also platform support grants and training awards. And the platform support grants in particular are meant to really complement the infrastructure investments that are being made by the government and by private donors. So we provide operating funding to be able to hire and train technicians, for example, to use these technologies. And this has been a really well-received program on our part. The three grant types uh, were developed in close consultation with a science community, and through an international science advisory council, we continue to monitor progress to ensure that our programs are at or ahead of the curve. And all of our programs are run through national open competitions with rigorous international in-person peer review. The projects that we're funding are connecting researchers across the country, across disciplines and institutions. They're bridging neuroscience and technology, and they're bringing new thinking and new approaches to understanding both diseases, as well as common underlying mechanisms and the brain as a whole. But our programs have also encouraged Canadians to partner with international collaborations. And in addition to that, we ourselves have sought out partnerships with the U.S. Brain Initiative, the Alzheimer's Association, and through a partnership with the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research and their global call for ideas, looking at large collaborations involving Canadian researchers. To continue on the success of the public-private partnership, in 2016, the newly elected Government of Canada allocated an additional $20 million to this fund to keep up the momentum. So I can say that not only do we have a very cool prime minister, but we have a leader who really recognizes the importance of science and technology and has shown that this is an area for investment. We're at an important moment now where we're looking at how we can best balance both the top-down, more strategic initiatives with the bottom-up efforts that have really been our signature. And as Tony Phillips mentioned, last week the Government of Canada announced funding in the tune of $150 million to McGill University and Western around the Canada First Research Investment. This presents a window of opportunity for us to look at a platform support grant which will enable us to promote open science and data sharing across the country. Canadian researchers have long been great collaborators, and I think as Tony has shown you that we also, as funders, work as part of an ecosystem. We're very excited to be uh, forming a Canadian global effort, and that's something that is in the works now. And we, we want to, with this opportunity and others, look at how we can define our role in a larger global initiative. I do want to close, though, by saying that as our history has shown that while we look at these really important moments of big initiatives, we also have to continue to find mechanisms to support these smaller initiatives that emerge from new and unorthodox collaborations that are pursued by bold scientists. And I think that the small, bold ideas of today really are the ones that can become the big, bold ideas of tomorrow. Thank you.
So in, in recognition of our special relationship with Canada, um, we have an unannounced, very brief addition to the program. Um, the next speaker will be Alan Bernstein from CIFAR. And I just want to mention um, that here at the meeting, I just want to call out that Alan Evans from McGill um, is also here attending the meeting today. Thank you very much, Corey. I want to congratulate you and Raphael for uh, putting all of this together. Um, I think what you're doing is sort of at the core of what CIFAR does, which is to bring people together from around the world, uh, from very different backgrounds and therefore perspectives, to address the question of importance to the world. So I've now told you what CIFAR does. Um, so let me give you, um, uh, and the, at the core of our belief, where we've been going for 34 years now, roughly, um, is the idea that bringing together the world's best scientists is the best way to address questions of importance to the world. Uh, so a few stats. Uh, we have about 400 fellows from 18 countries uh, who are in 120 institutions. Uh, we are not a funder of research. We are a convener of conversations. And our perspective is to have a deep, sustained conversation across disciplines and across countries requires not just a one-time meeting, but indeed our 14 programs, uh, current programs, have been going for over four, uh, have been going for many years. They're funded on a five-year uh, rotating basis. They're reviewed very stringently and internationally uh, by international groups. Um, uh, and they've made very, I think, important uh, contributions to our understanding of knowledge in a whole variety of areas. I'm gonna focus on the five that relate to, to the brain to give you partly an example of uh, what we've been doing. Uh, the first one is our program in learning of machines and brains. You all know about deep learning. That came out of CIFAR, Jeff Hinton, uh, Jan LeCun, who's now head of AI at Facebook, um, uh, and Joshua Bengio. Um, and that program was put together about 12 years ago um, as a very high risk, which also defines what CIFAR does, project including neurobiologists, uh, mathematicians, and computer scientists to try to learn from how people learn, how we learn, uh, at least at the state of our knowledge uh, 12 years ago, and apply that to developing uh, novel computer algorithms for deep learning or deep neural networks, as it was first called. And out of that came deep learning, uh, really the most commonly used form of AI uh, uh, today. That group is uh, still in existence. Uh, it was just funded with a huge grant, as Tony Phillips had told you, from the government of Canada. Uh, its goal now is to uh, try to uh, uh, continue to mimic or model and be inspired by how our brain learns, at least how, how we understand our brain learns, to do what's called unstructured uh, deep learning, and they're busy at work at that. Second program is called Child and Brain Development. Uh, that program uh, is interested in the complex interplay between uh, our experiences as we go through life um, and our genome. Um, and out of that has come, for example, work by Michael Meany and others on epigenetic changes in the genome as a result of a child's experiences, especially early in life. The third one is genetic networks. They're interested in applying network theory, systems thinking to everything in biology from cell division to how our, how our brain functions. Uh, Brenda Andrews and Charlie Boone are really the world leaders uh, in understanding all the genetic interactions in a cell. They've, they've torn apart the yeast cell uh, using suppressor screens and really dissected out every possible genetic interaction. Uh, and then uh, two other new programs that came out of our global call for ideas. It was a call for the world scientists to contribute uh, new ideas for new programs. Our, one of our, those four new programs is called Brain, Mind, and Consciousness. It includes everybody from psychiatrists to cognitive psych, uh, uh, psychologists to philosophers. Daniel Dennett from Boston is a member of that program. And the last one is Humans in the Microbiome. They're interested in uh, human evolution and brain development and the impact of our microbiome on those two processes. So finally, I'll just say that um, I believe, and CIFAR believes, that convening the world's best scientists in an interdisciplinary, global way is exactly the best way to make profound progress on important questions uh, like the brain, and that's what we're about. Uh, I'll end where I began, which is to congratulate all of you for putting this together uh, and the sponsors of this, of this day. Um, and CIFAR is available and really interested in helping out in any way that we can in advancing a global brain initiative. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Jeffrey Borenstein, the President and Chief Executive Officer of Brain Behavior Research Foundation.
Good morning. I'm honored to be a participant in this meeting and want to share with you the Foundation's ongoing role as a part of the global efforts to combine the power of public and private support for research. Since 1987, the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation has awarded more than $360 million to fund more than 5,000 grants to more than 4,000 scientists around the world. We funded scientists in 34 countries, many of which are represented here today. We can measure our impact through the multiplier effect. Our seed money, in many ways we take the approach that's been discussed here, which is ideas from the bottom up, our seed money has led to over $3.5 billion in additional funding for these scientists. A recent RAND Europe analysis of global mental health research funding over the past five years found that our foundation is the most cited non-government mental health research funder cited in published articles. Our foundation is a collaboration between scientists and donors. Research projects are selected by the Foundation Scientific Council comprised of 164 leading experts across disciplines in brain and behavior research. The, found, the Scientific Council was founded and is led by Dr. Herb Pardis. Our grants are funded by private contributions. Our donors who give at all economic levels look to the Scientific Council as trusted advisors in selecting the scientists they support. We have an active board led by the pioneering philanthropist Steve Lieber, who along with his late wife Connie, who passed away this January, has provided visionary leadership in brain research funding. Our model encourages new and innovative research in that we're able to support new ideas from the bottom up generated by scientists. Examples include the early support for optogenetics, deep brain stimulation for the treatment of depression, transcranial magnetic stimulation, and rapid acting antidepressants. Each of these important breakthroughs received initial key support from grants provided by our foundation. In 2016, the foundation will provide more than $19 million in grants to approximately 400 young investigators 80 independent mid-career investigators, and 15 senior investigators. These grants enable these outstanding scientists to pursue new cutting-edge ideas. In order to increase support for government investment in research, as well as private philanthropic support, the public needs to understand the value and the promise of research. In addition to funding research, the foundation spearheads ongoing campaigns to raise awareness and educate the public about research. We sponsor free monthly webinars for the lay public, which feature conversations with leading scientists. The foundation's quarterly print magazine provides updates about research written for non-scientists. The foundation hosts an annual International Mental Health Research Symposium where leading researchers present cutting edge discoveries. And our annual international awards dinner truly is the Academy Awards for brain scientists. In addition to our outstanding achievement prize winners, we also present the Pardis Humanitarian Prize in Mental Health, given to individuals like Drs. Betty and David Hamburg and former First Lady Rosalind Carter, whose humanitarian work has been transformative in improving the lives of people suffering from mental illness. I'm also proud to serve as the host of Healthy Minds, the award-winning public television series produced by the Foundation. The program shares cutting-edge information, including the latest research advances, along with personal experiences from people who live with psychiatric conditions. The goal of the series is to reduce stigma and encourage people who have a psychiatric condition not to suffer in silence, but to seek help. I want people to know that with help, there is hope. And with research, more help is on the way. The new season of Healthy Minds will premiere on public television stations across the country later this fall. Over the past 29 years, the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation has been responsible for seeding 
the research of a generation of brilliant young neuroscientists. This seed money, along with subsequent government funding, serves as a model for private public support for research. Our goal is that through research, people with mental illness will live full, productive, and happy lives. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Viren Jain from Google. Okay, think, <clears throat> thanks a lot, uh, Corey and Rafa, for the invitation to speak today. Um, so I want to make uh, three different points. Uh, the first two are sort of general scientific uh, context for what we're doing, and then the third point I'll describe what we're actually doing at Google. Um, and so the first point um, is just that the emergence of imaging as a dominant force of data acquisition in biology puts machine perception at the forefront of technical limitations to further progress. So microscopes have obviously always been powerful tools in biology, but fundamental developments in imaging, optics, and labeling methods uh, have dramatically changed the scene in recent years. Um, and these have advanced both the spatial and temporal resolution of the types of images that can be acquired. So major examples are two-photon microscopy, array tomography, super-resolution optical methods, 3D electrical microscopy, <clears throat> and so on. But these advances also present a certain challenge uh, in that extracting biologically or clinically relevant information from such data sets in a high-throughput matter quickly overwhelms manual effort uh, and demands ultimately assistance from computers. And this is hardly a novel observation. Um, there have been numerous centers for algorithmic image analysis that have been springing up uh, over the past decade. But we're at a good time to revisit the overall state of algorithmic image analysis um, and assess where the most urgent work is because of the second point that I'd like to make. So the second point is that we're potentially entering an age of statistically reliable progress in machine vision and associated capabilities. So a data point of sorts is the image in a competition. So this is a competition organized by computer scientists where the goal is to automatically produce labelings specifying where objects are present in an image. In 2011, the best algorithm was able to correctly classify images with a 25% error rate. So one out of every four images basically had some sort of major problem with the, with the, with the prediction that the computer was generating. With the application of convolutional networks to the data, to the data in the competition, that error rate went down to 16.4% in 2012, 11% in 2013, 6.7% in 2014, uh, and the most recent systems actually have uh, better than human performance of 3.7%. So what I mean by statistically reliable progress is that much like in the case of semiconductors for the past few decades at least, the, the number of organizations pursuing advances in this technology and the potency of the current set of ideas has reached the point that we might begin to expect meaningful progress on a very regular schedule. And ImageNet is just one example of this, but um, at Google and in other places, uh, there's been many examples. So speech recognition, methods for analyzing the content of, of text, uh, and so on and so forth. So with those two observations in mind, um, our effort, um, one of our efforts in neuroscience at Google, uh, seeks to combine advances in biological imaging uh, and machine perception with the initial and specific goal of mapping nervous systems. Uh, achieving this involves several different engineering and scientific challenges. Uh, the first is simply dealing with the data. So a major modality for current efforts is 3D electron microscopy, where even a cubic millimeter of tissue generates uh, a petabyte of data, and a whole mouse brain might be hundreds of petabytes of data. So we have to develop infrastructure for managing that data, querying it, processing it, and so on. Associated with that is the challenge of organizing access and visualization and annotation of that data. So here, the basic problem we're trying to address is how can we enable people worldwide to collaborate and organize around the same data sets without worrying about the details of data distribution, scalability, and so on. So maybe a biologist on the East Coast is acquiring a new data set and would like her collaborators in Germany or Taiwan to be able to analyze and annotate it. How can we make this easy and scalable for the scientific community? Uh, and finally, and arguably most importantly, there's the issue of automated analysis. How can we build flexible and powerful algorithms that can extract the desired information from the raw data autonomously? For example, in the case of nervous system reconstruction, we would like to use nanometer resolution 3D images of brain tissue to reconstruct the wiring diagram of the cells in the tissue. This turns out to be a notoriously difficult problem uh, where even state-of-the-art computer vision methods may have difficulties, so we're investing a significant amount of research and development into pushing the state-of-the-art in this area. So as I mentioned, uh, we're currently intensely focused on this intersection of machine perception and biological imaging. Uh, over the past few years, our internal efforts in collaboration, uh, close collaboration with partners at HHMI, the Allen Institute, and the Max Planck Institute, we've actually made some quite significant progress in the um, accuracy and scalability of our systems for dealing with this data. 
And if we see that progress continue, uh, we would expect that data sets on the scale of petabytes or larger uh, really will be tractable for automated analysis within the next five years. Uh, over the long term, we'd like to help the community to routinely, cheaply, and reliably perform such reconstructions, and we're particularly interested in two major questions that we pose by such capabilities. The first is <clears throat> actually a methodological question, which is how can we analyze nervous system variability? In other words, what kinds of analytical techniques can we use and develop to understand how nervous systems vary in the same way that an entire field of computational biology has been developed to try and understand genomic variability? And the second question, uh, which is kind of a strategic or planning question, which is uh, we'd, like to, we'd actually like help from the community to understand, uh, which is how can we use this type of information about the nervous system to improve human health? What understanding of brain disorders from the point of view of connectivity and associated data would be a benefit to the medical community, uh, and where can technology help advance those goals? So I'll stop there, and thanks. Our next speaker is Kunal Ghosh, the founder and chief executive officer of Inscopics. First, I wanted to say thank you to Corey and, and Rafa for, for putting this together and, and for inviting me to be part of this uh, very special event. Uh, love to spend a few minutes uh, to talk about Inscopics, uh, what we're doing to, to advance brain research, but also to talk about the role of industry in, in this space, what, what companies, big and small, can do to, to really help catalyze brain science. Um, in, in a way, the genomics industry uh, has helped catalyze the, the genomics revolution. Many of you know Inscopex um, by the miniature integrated microscope. Uh, the company is based in Palo Alto, California, spun out of Stanford in 2011 uh, to really commercialize this uh, miniature integrated microscope for imaging large-scale neural circuit activity in freely behaving rodents. The company has evolved quite a bit since then in, in the last four to five years. We're now working really hard to, to build platforms, both hardware and software, that truly enable the understanding of the brain in action agnostic of, of animal models. So today, while we're still focused, and many of our customers and collaborators are still focused on the rodent model, we're actively working to translate our core technologies into marmosets, macaques, uh, non-human primate models, um, as close as we can get to, to the human species. Most of our efforts are, are focused both in terms of technology development and, and software development on understanding circuits. We have fundamentally believed um, from our Stanford days that the key to really understanding how the brain works and, and how it does not is understanding how neural circuits underlie brain function and dysfunction. So inherently, our work and, and our vision overall is very well aligned with, with the U.S. Brain Initiative, and we're very grateful to have been acknowledged by, by the White House and the White House OSTP as a private sector partner of, of the Brain Initiative. Just last year, the World Economic Forum also recognized us as a technology pioneer, and, and that recognition certainly has enabled um, us to get a little bit of visibility on, on a global stage, much like the visibility we're, we're very privileged to have here today. I could probably spend more than an hour um, speaking about some of the science that uh, our customers and collaborators are already doing with, with Invista, the productized version of the miniature microscope. I'll choose, however, to just focus on four archetypes. Most of our customers and collaborators, there are about 150 labs now across the world that, that are using Invista and Inscopics as solutions, are, are working on science in, in, in three or four different archetypes. The first um, is really trying to understand the, the circuit basis of disease, and, and this was brought up uh, a few times uh, today, and, and certainly Walter in his talk mentioned um, the NIH's focus um, on, on this particular um, angle. In, in, in the first um, example here, um, this is work done um, actually with the pharmaceutical company, um, Janssen R&D, part of the J&J group. We're literally looking at, at, a, at an animal model, a mouse model of epilepsy, and, and trying to identify the circuit signature, if you will, the circuit pattern that correlates to, to the epileptic disease state. And in this particular example, we all also found that the, the imaging um, circuit pattern was predictive of, of the seizure. Moving on, uh, a couple of the uh, investigators uh, that are working on, on understanding neural circuits uh, with respect to how neural circuits um, underlying brain function are, these videos unfortunately are not 
playing this ladder too, but, but if there were, um, you would see b flashing neurons uh, in the right panel in, in, in the second video and, and a behaving animal, uh, behaving mouse. And in this particular archetype, researchers in, in, in this case at Stanford and, and many others um, across the world are trying to understand neural ensemble activity. And this also was brought up a few times this morning. Um, how do neural circuits process information? Uh, how can we understand um, uh, circuit um, maps and, and encoding um, during behavior during brain function. The third archetype is, is actually quite basic in, in, in many ways. It's trying to understand cell type and, and cell type activity. And in this um, specific example, researchers at, at HHMI, Janelia Farm, uh, Scott Sternson and, and his group uh, were, were really trying to understand hunger. And there's a group of neurons called AGRP neurons that they identified, and, and they, they really work to dissect how the AGRP neurons uh, regulate hunger. So briefly speaking, those are three main archetypes that uh, are today being enabled by the Inscopix platform. The fourth here transcends these archetypes. It's, it's literally employing the technology for long-term studies where one can look at a particular circuit, uh, a, a large number of neurons, over time, over hours. And, and one, of course, application of this is understanding sleep-wake cycles. In the interest of, of time, again, uh, just zooming out a little bit, uh, we've, again, only been around for, for about four, four to five years now. The, the first product, Investa, has, has just been um, around for about three years. We launched it at SFN in 2012. But we're really privileged already to have about 150 labs across the world. Neuroscience has no borders. We have um, early adopters um, from Norway to, to Japan um, to several countries in, in Europe and, of course, um, here, here in the US. And what's most gratifying for us, and this is the measure of our success, is the success of our scientists. Entirely, all of Inscopix's efforts today are with respect to catalyzing science. And we're really privileged to have uh, a pretty um, eclectic group of scientists, um, esteemed um, and established investigators, but also about 40 early career investigators that are, are pioneering all kinds of um, circuit questions uh, with respect to um, understanding um, brain function. I also wanted to briefly acknowledge uh, the team at Inscopix, and I'll just make one point here in the interest of time. Uh, while we're still building out our team, we're, we have a truly interdisciplinary team with about 12 neuroscientists, um, card-carrying neuroscientists that are working on all kinds of applications and partnering with, uh, with scientists to build integrated solutions for neuroscience. And, and I'll end by, by saying that what we're trying to do at Inscopix and what we hope will, will happen in this field is not just develop new technologies and, and products for neuroscience, but really partner all across the workflow from sample prep in the future, hopefully reagent development, through to analytics and training so that scientists can not just have access to game-changing technologies, but can actually use them in, in very efficient manners to do science. And we feel that there's a role for industry and an ecosystem to not just innovate on technologies, but to also catalyze research through integrated workflows. And, and this is the, 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 the last slide here, and, and really the, the only message, if, if there's one message uh, that I'd like to leave you with from, from this um, presentation, there's a precedent. The precedent is in the genomics industry. The genomics research and the genomics revolution that we now are all aware of was in large part catalyzed by a tools industry. And not only was the science catalyzed, but it also created thousands of jobs as companies started being formed across many of the genomics research needs. I truly hope that we see something similar in this space and, and would love to um, engage with, with all of you here today to the best extent I can to just hear your ideas on how we can create such an ecosystem for this space. Thank you. Final speaker before lunch is Daryl Kipke, the president of Neuronexus. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to, to speak here. Uh, so Neuronexus is a neurotechnology company that provides some of the critical tools and systems uh, needed to catalyze uh, systems neuroscience around the world. And one of our, uh, our we're many of our customers uh, around the world, in, in pretty much all the regions, are receive uh, funding uh, supported through the Brain Initiative and the different brain research programs that we heard about. And also, Neuronexus, even though we're a, a commercial uh, public company today, 
uh, much to Kunal's point, uh, we started out uh, in, in academia, and we can trace our roots back to the University of Michigan, and at Michigan, and as a startup company, uh, we received uh, some support from the NSF and the NIH, and I, I think we're uh, really a success story of tech transfer uh, in, in the U.S. So NeuroNexus is focused on uh, neural interfaces, and by that I mean it's the devices, uh, the probes, and the systems required to uh, interface with selected areas of the brain throughout the nervous system, the brain and, and, and the periphery. Um, and those devices uh, involve probes uh, or electrodes or sensors of various sizes and shapes that are designed specifically to target with neural structures as well as systems that are needed to uh, acquire that data and get it into a, a form for subsequent data analysis. So in a way, we provide the, uh, our products really provide the pipes uh, down to the brain uh, up to big data uh, for, the, the, for the field. We operate across the, the range of, of, of neuroscience from basic research to applied research uh, to uh, translational clinical research. And with our parent company, NuVectra, uh, we're involved in uh, commercial clinical applications. It, part of our, uh, one measure of our impact, and I trace this back to my academic roots, my own personal academic roots, is that a measure of impact is publications. And so uh, every month and sometimes every week, uh, there's a paper published in a leading journal uh, that uses NeuroNexus devices. And we're, we're uh, proud of that. So when we, when we think about neural interfacing, uh, one of the things we've learned over the years is that you really have to, it's important to embrace the complexity of the brain. It's not one size fits all, certainly. And we have uh, developed a, a host of different probes or sensors to target specific areas uh, throughout the nervous system. Um, in, in model systems from insects, fruit flies, all the way up to non-human primates and, and uh, humans, in fact. And also the time scales. Uh, we can't go out to the billions of light years that we heard about this morning, but uh, our devices are designed for over to work for, you know, second, or for millisecond, sub-millisecond resolution that could work out to years and even lifetimes eventually. Um, the other half of, of, uh, of neural interfacing is the system. And, uh, to acquire the data. And recently in the industry, and including in our company, there have been very, very encouraging developments in developing systems and software to be able to acquire the data. And there are very big trends, as you've heard uh, this morning, about uh, interest in, in uh, recording larger and larger scale, or larger and larger scale systems to record from not 10 or uh, 100, but hundreds to thousands of different neurons or to even drive neural populations at a very selective level. And the encouraging news is that the, these probes and systems are coming together to really enable that. And today, uh, uh, a young investigator, pretty much anywhere in the world, could come to our company uh, and, and pretty much uh, purchase or, or order uh, a plug and play system that would allow them to record or interface up to um, a 256-site uh, electrode and uh, in whatever model system that they were interested in. And that's really, uh, that, that, that I think uh, is a very encouraging achievement um, and, and almost milestone where it brings high-level science to the point where it doesn't take uh, uh, specialty real power labs to be able to do it. So uh, I think that in, in the context of these uh, neuroscience research that we're talking about, um, it rests really on a triad of the, the, the neuroscience endeavor really rests on a triad of drivers. There's clinical drivers uh, uh, that speak to the, the clinical need and, and the opportunity to help people. Uh, there's neurotechnology drivers uh, because one of the fundamental aspects of, of neuroscience and this whole area that we're talking about is it's really driven by technologies. And then uh, finally, there's neuroscience, last but not least, neuroscience drivers. 
and um, just the, the quest to explore and understand further how the brain works. And so we're, we've worked very hard to, to position our company and our, the work that we can do uh, to be kind of right in the middle of, these, of, this, of this space and to try to make, help make it resonate as much as possible. And we look forward, as in the context of these discussions and going forward, to, um, uh, to having discussions about how we could collaborate uh, uh, with both scientists and technologists uh, to help accelerate the field. Um, thank you. Yeah, so just um, this is the end of the morning session. Thank you all very much for participating. Thank you all for the speakers for staying on time. Um, we have a little extra time in the afternoon, so I suggest that we come back from lunch at 1.45 um, rather than 1.30, so there's time for conversation. And, and uh, just a few um, words for some people we left out. Um, so uh, also in, in, in terms of networking, there's uh, representing Spain, that is Ana Elorza from uh, Councillor of Science of the Spanish Embassy in Washington, and Gonzalo Leon, representing the Spanish Minister of uh, Science and Innovation. And uh, the Gatsby Foundation is represented by its director, Sarah Kadic. The Gatsby Foundation played a critical role in the first meeting that initiated the, uh, what became the Brain Initiative, and she's around as well. And also, I uh, just wanted to thank uh, the viewers that have joined us remotely. This meeting is uh, uh, broadcast uh, live, webcast uh, live, and uh, many people who couldn't come to, uh, to here to New York today are uh, following remotely. Uh, finally, some of you have asked us for copies of the slides. The meeting will be posted. Uh, the entire uh, video of the meeting is going to be posted in the website. If you want any particular material or slides, I recommend that you contact the speakers directly. Thank you a lot, and see you after lunch.